Mohit, I think we sh- uh, we'll ask you probably. Have you muted your? Dr. Mohit got, I think, logged out. Logged out, is it? Oh, maybe his yeah, connection yeah. is not good. Okay, we can. Sir, you can continue the meeting, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll do that. Uh, just let me get this. Uh, Uh, good evening, everybody. I think uh, there is some problem with uh, Mohin's, uh, Mohit's uh, connectivity. So let us start off with the first case today. And uh, I think this is uh, just a minute because I need to get the uh, program. On. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Right. So welcome to all. And uh, as uh, Navi Mumbai and uh, uh, Navi Mumbai Gainit Society, together we are going to host this uh, webinar. And today we have a very interesting uh, three cases, um, case-based panel discussions. And we have a, a very elite uh, faculty with us. And we have wonderful uh, presenters who are very young and then have been doing a lot of good work in this field. Uh, can I first request uh, Dr. Pooja uh, Vazirani to present her case. That is an approach to a case of rare uh, fetal pelvic cystic lesion. Over to you, Dr. Pooja. Hello. Yeah, good, great, great. Your screen is seen. So seen well, heard well. Yeah, yeah, your screen is seen. You can go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today's presentation is on an interesting case of a fetal intra-abdominal pelvic cyst. Uh, Dr. Mohit was the moderator, and we have uh, on panel uh, Dr. Rakesh Sahu, who's an obstetrician at uh, Dr. Elish Hirandani Hospital. Dr. Rakesh Rao, the senior pediatric surgeon at the SRCC Hospital, uh, Worli. Dr. Hiren Panwala, a pediatric radiologist from SRCC Children's Hospital, Worli, and myself. So this uh, Mrs. St, a low-risk primary gravida, registered with us at about 12 weeks. Her NT scan was completely fine. The combined screening was low risk. Her anomaly scan showed a normal uh, growing fetus with normal anatomy. However, at 30 weeks, we could see two cystic areas in the pelvis of this uh, baby. We put color to distinguish the urinary bladder where you can see the umbilical arteries on each side. So the upper cystic lesion or the area was the urinary bladder of the baby. And what we see below is a clear cyst which was seen in the pelvis. Now, this was exactly behind and below the bladder of the baby. It measured about 3.6 into 2.4 centimeters clear. And its close proximity to the sacrum was very well seen. So this was the cystic area below and behind the urinary bladder, actually pushing up the bladder up. And behind that was the sacrum. So, Dr. Mohit was actually yeah, yeah, going yeah. to... No, I'm back. Ah, yeah, Mohit is there. Okay. I'm so sorry. I, I connected. Now, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt this in a way. I don't know what happened, but I'm but going anyway, to you can discuss, discuss this case about... Uh, this panel is all about how you approach an unusual case of a fetal pelvic cyst. And um, my uh, question to you at this stage is that... You know, you've seen a cyst. So what is your approach in cases of an intra-abdominal cyst in a fetus? So we all know that the abdomen has multiple organs. However, to simplify and come to a boil down to a diagnosis, which is more uh, closer to the actual diagnosis, is we divide the abdominal quadrants into various uh, areas. And depending on the cyst location, we boil down the differential to it. So... First is the location of the cyst, where it is, upper quadrants, lower quadrants, and the appearance of the cyst, whether it has got debris, whether it's simple, complex, and how we progress. So it's basically location and appearance of the cyst. So in today's case, the area of interest is the pelvic region. 
as i was saying the appearance of the cyst whether it is multi located septate debris ecogenic material vascularity associated hydrourethro nephrosis ascites or any other malformation along with the cyst or merely the size of the cyst a large cyst more than 4 cm these are all complex cyst as well as simple clear cyst less than 4 cm without any debris and whatever we have said like an isolated one in the year 2019 this was a paper in fetal diagnosis and therapy where they actually divided the uh, gender uh, association with the intra abdominal cyst and it was a very good study where they said that in a female fetus beyond the second late second trimester beyond 28 weeks majority of the cyst were related to the ovary and whereas in males the cyst were found more early a bit in the early second trimester and of course related to urogenital system the git and other etiologies so gender identification whenever a cyst is seen in intra abdominal was stressed out in this paper so you have seen the cyst you have identified it is simple excluded complex so what is the next step what anatomical fetal parts would you like to focus on when you see a fetal pelvic cyst so since we have seen the cyst which is simple in the pelvic region and so the first step is to see the gender so this was uh, clearly demarcated it was a female baby and the second step would be to localize areas near the cyst as in a female pelvic region so this is a diagrammatic view where you can see the bladder anteriorly you have the vagina you have the uterus and behind that you have the rectum and the anal canal and behind that you have the sacrum so this is the area of interest what we are looking into in this baby after having determining the sex of the baby that is the female pelvic cyst and the location so now so you have identified the location you are saying it is simple so what dds did you run in your mind when you saw this case so when you see the gender so a female fetus with the pelvic cyst the differential would be a ovarian cyst in the late first time this was a 30.5 weeks pregnancy so you have ovarian cyst coming up that time hydrometro or hydrometro colpus anorectal malformation if it's associated with other malformations and complex cases like the persistent cloaca and urogenital sinus as per as the location of the cyst it can either be intestinal duplication cyst because it was closer to the rectum or the pre sacral myelocele which is a rare diagnosis but yet proven because it was very close to the sacrum on ultrasound so it was exactly between the sacrum and the bladder down below so we boiled down to these two why did i do that because the the cyst had clear fluid it did not have any debris there were no there there was no ascites there was no any it was not multi loculated there was no polyhydramnios no oligohydramnios and no kidney related malformations where we were suspecting the urinary bladder to be compressed so there was nothing like that teratoma it was a non vascular cyst so because of these things we boiled down to these four uh, differential when we gave the report to the mother right so what are the next steps in imaging i mean you've seen it you have narrowed down four differentials did you think of doing anything further on this yeah so when we saw the cyst the differential will come when you see the baby in detail as per the anatomy so the git has to be seen very uh, uh, importantly so the small stomach the small intestine the large intestine the gut that the kidneys were absolutely fine the bladder was fine the lyco was fine so bladder function was preserved of course we the neck also to rule out anorectal malformations uh, the the good thing on ultrasound is to see the perianal uh, muscular complex which is the hypoechoic area which is the anal muscle and you have a ecogenic center which is the lumen so when you see this nice circular target sign you rule out anorectal malformations to a very large extent and secondly we have to see the spine in detail especially when it is so close to the sacral spine of course i have never seen a case of sacral myelocele but definitely when literature search was done we we did see the spine nicely there was no uh, herniation or no continuity but as far as the literature says on ultrasound it is really difficult to see whether the cyst is actually communicating to with uh, to the sacral uh, uh, spinal cord or there is a herniation 
So definitely the spine was very important to be seen in this baby. So how did we go about giving these four is an ovarian cyst. Uh, what was going against the diagnosis of ovarian was it was not lateral. It was midline, posterior and below the bladder. Though can be a posterior ovarian cyst can be seen like that. It was a simple one. Complex ones can have septate. What went against the diagnosis of hydrometropolis? Now we were we, we had only these four boiled down, but I'm just ruling out what we did not find, which was close to this diagnosis. Is the cyst had, was simple again, it did not have any debris, but this hydrometropolis, you'll have ecogenic areas, you'll have debris settling into the cyst. The cyst may be progressively large as the baby advances in pregnancy. The cyst may compress the bladder outlet and you may have hydronephrosis, hydroureteronephrosis. And sometimes in some cases, you can see the pelvis actually filled to the debris from this connection. Because finally, in erectile malformations, you have unit, unit, the, there's a unity between the urinary bladder, the vagina and the rectum. So there's a single external opening and internally all these systems are joined. So you may have progressive changes in the cyst appearance, size, and complications such as ascites, severe hydroureteronephrosis, it can have polyhydramnios or it can have oligohydramnios because of push to the bladder and bladder outlet kind of an obstruction. So these were the things. When we thought of hydrometropolis, we also checked into the anatomy of the baby. You need to see the extra fingers to rule out certain syndromes like the McCusick Kaufman syndrome. When you see the kidneys are fine, uh, the, the, we cannot see the uterus malformation on ultrasound so well. But these are the common syndromes which are associated with hydrometropolis. What you can see on ultrasound, the GUT, the, the extremities, and any other cardiac abnormalities or a spinal abnormality associated with these cases of hydrometropolis. Now, why did it go against the diagnosis of intestinal duplication cyst? I don't have much experience on this. I've not seen much right. of it. I think, sir has a very good experience on seeing intestinal so duplications. The intestinal duplications, see, the, as Dr. Puja has rightly said, you have to exclude one by one. Intestinal duplications have a gut signature. So you have a cyst which can also actually show peristalsis with the peristalsis of the adjacent bowel. You can have change in shape of the cyst as you follow them up. But the classical sign is a <clears throat> gut signature with a thick wall in association with a part of the bowel that can you know, uh, push it towards an intestinal duplication cyst. Of course, that cyst being in that tight compartment uh, was always a differential because it was tightly compressed in between <clears throat> the anterior to the rectum and posterior to the bladder. But generally, when you see duplication cysts, we look for these thick walls and these uh, <coughs> classical features that you want to exclude. Also, did you also think of uh, a cloacal dysgenesis? So the anorectal complex was absolutely nice to yes. see. Yes. So then, yes, we do. So we this... did exclude the complexity from this differential diagnosis that we did no. not stress on anorectal malformations or yeah. uh, persistent cystic structures also tend to have more debris later on when they mix with urine. Rightly so. Yes, please continue, Dr. Pujan. And this was a nice uh, a case, a case presentation in the White Journal in the year 2010. This is a presacral mylocene. So if you see, this was a clear cyst, which is pear shaped, again in the midline pelvic region. They did an MRI for this fetus. Now, actually, if you see our case, this large cyst was exactly abutting the sacral spine as seen in this case as well. But what was nicely seen in MRI is this minute continuation or coming the herniation from the say, the canal which was uh, oblique, uh, open that is between the L3 L4 you can see the uh, opening of the posterior part of the vertebral elements and from there this was the herniation of the mylocene so this was beautifully diagnosed on MRI which assess which assisted the diagnosis of the presacral mylocene in this case so this was one thing which was there we didn't do an MRI or we could not find an, uh, the continuity. However, it's very difficult. Therefore, this was also given as one of the differential in our case so far. Rest of the fetus appeared structurally normal for the period of gestation. 
the fetal heart, the fetal echo was normal, normal brain anatomy, normal growth and liker of the baby. So what's your final impression then? So in view of the gestational age, that is the late second trimester, early third trimester, female baby, location and appearance of the pelvic cyst, it's not perineum, pelvic placement of the cyst, we give a DD of, as I said, hydrocolpus, which may be part of the urogenital sinus abnormality, may still evolve, she was only 30 weeks. So we cannot, when we counsel for differential, we cannot, we did not put a very rosy picture in terms of we gave the couple that also, today it's absolutely a low risk, simple cyst appearing, but it can evolve. So we made them prepared also that in, in due course of time when we are following, if there is a progressive increase in the size of the cyst, then we are looking forward to something which is related to the urogenital sinus. The posterior position of an ovarian cyst, this was given the intestinal uh, origin of the cyst, that is intestinal duplication cyst and sacral myloseed or meningoseed, very unlikely because we did not find any continuity, but still was a part of the differential. So Dr. Rakhi, uh, as an obstetrician who, who send this patient, normal anomaly scan, suddenly you find a cyst. Of course, Pooja would have talked with you, but when you see such patients, did you counsel them for any genetic testing or a further MR? What would have been your approach here when the patient came back to you? Yeah. Uh, yes, Dr. Mohit. Uh, uh, since we work as an obstetric fetal medicine uh, team, uh, since this was uh, diagnosed quite late at 30 weeks, like the patient was following up right from the first trimester, by the end of the anomaly scan, we say that we expect the baby to be normal. And But we do tell them that, you know, cardiac and renal anomalies is what could be coming up at 28 weeks. But uh, um, uh, a pelvic cyst is not what we routinely would tell a patient that we expect that. But 30 weeks when this lady came up with this report saying that there's a pelvic cyst and for a fetus, 3.5 centimeter was fairly uh, a bigger cyst not to uh, counsel or talk about it. So one thing as an obstetrician, when it is 30 weeks, uh, the role of termination or giving a choice or counseling about that is out of question. So that makes our life a little easy that look, whatever be the anomaly, it's a, uh, it is an, a development and evolving thing. It could not have been diagnosed at 12 and 20 weeks. So the patients are a little, you know, 30 weeks is an advanced pregnancy. So they are also very receptive that, okay, we will have to continue with the pregnancy. My job was to tell that is the course of antenatal and the delivery process going to change because suddenly we see a cyst. Uh, Dr. Pooja had thankfully given a DD, like we couldn't pinpoint what it is. So they would always ask, what is it? What is it? And directly as Dr. Pooja and we couldn't men mention the sex of the baby. We would always talk in that's a probability that it's a female fetus then so and so. Uh, of course, they had Google search and they knew that this could be a female fetus with an ovarian cyst and various DDs which we had given. So I said that at 30 weeks, we continue with the same management. All we need is a follow-up, a routine follow-up, but not a uh, close follow-up of every weekly thing. Like Dr. Pooja also said that you come back after like, you know, at least minimum two or four weeks and then we go ahead. And thankfully, there was no associate. The only thing there was no associated other anomaly. Yeah. So, did you counsel them for any genetic dates? Was it discussed? I mean, did they um, ask for... Yes, because genetic counseling was done by the 12th week and anomaly scan. So, we had almost ruled out that we would need a genetic counseling at that time. But at 30 Good weeks, not. we said that I did not really press on that uh, okay. we would need a genetic uh, thing because I think no other soft markers. Right. Uh, so, and... Uh, I like even Dr. Pooja thought that we don't need uh, an uh, amniosynthesis or an NIPS to pinpoint uh, a genetic abnormality. Yeah, so I, mean, it did not, I, mean, I did not press on having a genetic uh, workup done. No, no, the best thing is when we both talk the same language. When you say that this can happen, a normal anomaly scan with access can happen, half the conflict is over. Okay. So I believe this is a very good point of working together when we discuss such cases, when we both communicate the same findings and same counseling, it uh, yes. goes a long way in building the trust of the patient. And so I think what we... did you, 
yeah so the patient also feels that uh, nothing is a miss like it's not about blaming each other right. or blaming anybody for that matter so it would be absolutely unethical to say that oh this should have been picked or could have been picked as we all understand it has to be a team work so thankfully in our case things were and the patient couple was also understanding they were not questioning in the terms that why and how uh, so thankfully we had a very understanding couple all throughout the pregnancy in fact she went on through the whole pregnancy well very good though. So then, Pooja, did you see her in four weeks? What did you find? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to add one more thing that uh, the counselling became a bit easier because when you talk about pelvic cysts in a female fetus, they are always in the late second trimester because of the maternal hormones acting on the uterus, vagina, all where the secretions will come up, and you will find ovarian cyst coming up later. The HPE axis of the baby will only be activated beyond this sec late second trimester. so that was uh, the the counseling in part which is important that this will never be seen in the anomaly scan so that's the take home message that it could never be there is no question of picking up it's not seen it won't be seen okay. hmm. yeah right so the 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 patient was very receptive good couple followed up four weekly uh, the findings remained the same throughout the cyst was exactly the same in size position there was no complexity the fetal growth like her everything was fine right so did it influence uh, how you would deliver this patient dr rakhi and what did you do postnatally right uh, dr mohit uh, uh, we made it very clear that this doesn't look like a life threatening thing and the mode of delivery should not uh, affect the uh, the prognosis of the child or the fetus like as we know open spina bifida meaning go by the seal or you know something which we could say that the trauma of the normal delivery could rupture it make it worse or the sepsis would increase i said this is a pelvic it's not even like you know it's not like um, like it's not an abdominal cyst which is hanging out omphalocele or something which would ma matter so the patient was very receptive that okay we are open for a normal delivery and cesarean could happen for any obstetric reason so i did let her go till term and at, at around 38 weeks plus she did go into spontaneous labor um the note was uh, everybody knew about the fetal cyst but that did not affect our line of management i let her progress normally the way i would let a primary gravida in spontaneous labor thankfully she delivered smoothly there was no fetal uh, decelerations or any issues because there was no oligo heartbeat was good she delivered a 3.3 kilo baby who cried immediately the liker was clear so the postnatal the baby even passed urine so that first uh, ruled out that you know there is not an genito urinary obstruction so that you know the pediatricians were aware the uh, the the pediatric surgeon dr gautam agarwal was also involved so all the counseling was done prenatally and postnatally by 48 hours all the doc doctors had seen the baby and they assured that there is no immediate surgical intervention needed so that did help the patient a lot they were quite relieved because the baby was crying feeding no whatsoever complications post op in fact she was discharged on day 3 as any other routine uh, uh, baby and delivery patient would go home yeah i mean see in a way it is very good that you excluded everything that could go wrong at the right. same time with, when you excluded everything the main dilemma still remains as to what is it what is that cyst if it is not a vaginal opening cyst is it the urinary spine the anus is fine where is this from so then uh, then did one you one thing is that this patient denied the fetal mri hmm ah. yes denied fetal mri and uh, postnatally when imaging was uh, the baby was subjected to the imaging like the first postnatal ultrasound and the mri they were not very conclusive and that made the patient anxious they could not see the ovaries well so because the baby was moving because it was not sedated and that's the uh, point where the patient took a second opinion and was referred to srcc hospital for further management because no, of this I'm, inconclusive thing no, i am not uh, sure whether my panelists were introduced uh, were they introduced to no 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 i think no i'm so sorry let me just go through that one moment Uh, Dr. Pooja Vajirani is a senior fetal medicine specialist at Hilandani and at Abhipraya. She is an expert, uh, has a degree in expert in uh, fetal medicine from Barcelona, and she is doing the master's course. And she will probably be one of the few people in India who would have done that. And she is um, uh, the Dr. Rakhi Sahu, 
is a senior obstetrician, clinical obstetrician from Hirandani Hospital, Pawai. Dr. Rakesh Shah is a senior pediatric surgeon from SRCC. And we have Dr. Hiren Panwala, who is a pediatric radiologist from SRCC. So welcome all. And um, Dr. Rakesh, when the patient was referred to you, you would have seen the patient clinically. What was yeah. your initial impression when you went through all of the clinical data? Yeah, I met the parents first, of course. They're extremely intelligent set of parents. They knew exactly what was happening. I think there were techies somewhere working in some tech company. That's number one. Number two is the way they have been counseled. I think I was seriously amazed. It doesn't happen in our part of the uh, city, basically. This kind of counseling. They knew, like Pooja knew exactly what, how, and they were they had been told exactly they were no hand handheld throughout the pregnancy and the delivery. And another uh, Raki Sahu, I can credit her that. Uh, and uh, now a C-section is a norm, basically, you know, most of the time. <laughs> it was nice of her not to kind of go, indulge in that if it was not necessary. Obstetric condition? Yes, I agree. Okay. Now coming to the child after I seeing them clinically, the child looked absolutely fine in the sense uh, the genitals, vestibule looked okay. Obviously, because of the edema and the puffiness, because of the maternal hormones, we couldn't examine them very clearly, but the anus looked okay and the vaginal opening looked all right. And so did the urethral opening. That's how it was. So the first test probably one would ask for a postnatal sonography again. And that's what we asked for. Uh, because the MRI that was done previously was not very conclusive. So that was the sonography we did, number one. And number two test that I asked for is an MRI, again, under proper sedation. Now, I think Hiren will let us know what happens. So, Dr. Hiren, uh, when you saw this, I mean, uh, could you explain the MR images of this uh, child, please? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, can, I, can I share my screen so that... Uh, yes, the, yes. the anatomy and uh, images are a bit more clear than the yes. videos. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll stop share. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, everybody can see. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just show you first one by one uh, what we see on MRI. So MRI uh, basically this T two weighted images they are very important when we are assessing for the pelvic organs on T2 weighted high resolution images, we ask for to look at the um, uterine, ovary and rest of the anatomy like uh, sphincter and those kind of things. But all these things that uh, anorectal malformation were clinically and uh, previously they have been ruled out. So that was not a question. Now, this is the sagittal image of uh, T2 weighted uh, scan of the pelvis area. And what we are seeing here that uh, this is the pubic symphysis and that is the uh, sacrum of the baby. And uh, this kind of elongated structure, what you are seeing, that is the, that is, this is the uterine uh, fungus and body, this one. And this elongated part is the cervix. Of course, in uh, neonatal period, the cervix will be uh, twice size of the fungus and because of the maternal hormones. So you are seeing bulky cervix as so this kind of cylindrical thing. Below that, you are seeing that this is the expected location of the vagina, which is looking like to be more elongated. And you are seeing this kind of uh, retort shape, uh, well-defined, uh, hyper-intense lesion, which is kind of fluid signal intensity. It's very bright. If you compare with the signal intensity, it is almost identical to the CSF. You can see that this is the CSF in the spine. If you can point my, can follow my arrows. So this is the uh, CSF in the spine, and that is almost identical to the signal intensity of that lesion. So that indicates that the lesion is cystic. And uh, you can see that uh, here at the time of the scan, the bladder was collapsed so that it's not well appreciated, but it is like anteriorly pushed by the cystic lesion. So that's the uh, sagittal anatomy, what we can infer on this image. You can see that this is the, uh, the rectum, which is coming in between the sacrum and the, uh, the cystic lesion. So that's very important finding that Dr. Pooja was running and was saying that there was no obvious communication with the spinal canal was seen. And actually, these are the uh, these are the neural foramina of sacral neural foramina. If it was a sacral meningocele or myelocele, we could have seen a tiny collection between those neural foramina. That was absent in this uh, case. So there was no communication with the spinal canal or any neural foramina. So that excluded the 
all this kind of anterior sacral uh, meningocele or myelocele that question was out the lesion was averting the the anterior wall of the rectum that we can see here that now i'll be going to the the axial scan which are very important for the identification of normal anatomy so i'll show you the the t2 weighted uh, images yeah so here uh, this is the area of that uh, perineal body lies and the anteriorly will be seeing the labia majora structures and posteriorly will be the rectum anterior will be the urethra and then uh, vagina will come so as we go higher up yeah here we can see that uh, this is the nice section so uh, one minute, i'll just stop here yeah so this, this is the posterior most area which is the part of the uh, anal canal and anteriorly you are seeing that this is the lowermost part of the vagina and if you see you are seeing some sort of uh, hyper intensity along the side of the vagina which is the end point of that cystic lesion as we go up you will see that uh, the cystic lesion on this side right side and this nice circular hypo intensity that is the urethra so that lesion was in relation to the right side vaginal wall right it is not in relation to the of course it's abutting the rectum as we go higher up but it was not looking like that it is arising from rectal wall or something now we are going higher up and you are seeing that this is the urethra and that is the uh, lower part of the cystic lesion and this is the vagina as we go higher up uh, more higher up you are seeing now the larger part of the cyst and this is the vaginal canal so here we thought that it is not looking inside the vagina as we expect in the hydrometrocolpos and all so um, there were, of course there was some fluid in the vagina because this cyst was causing indentation or compression of the vagina itself but if you notice the wall of the cyst, it was very thin and uh, it was not having that gut wall signature that Dr. Mohit sir was talking about. So it was not uh, fitting with that diagnosis of uh, duplication cyst also because the wall was very thinned out. And it was not having wall like vagina. You can see that nice thick wall of the vagina on the left side and anterior side. This is the vagina. So that was not looking like uh, vaginal wall also. And uh, as we go higher up, we could see that similar kind of uh, cystic area within the left vaginal fornix also in this patient that was looking like some sort of intraluminal but this lesion was looking somewhat along the wall of the right wall of the vagina as we go higher up we can we could see that uh, this is the left ovary which is like slightly bright and somewhere here was the uh, right ovary the same finding the ovaries we also cross check on usd and we could we were able to successfully locate them on USD and we could identify separately that the ovaries are separate and and uh, the lesion is also separate from the uterus cervix and there is no anomalies in the uterine cervix. So then we as a part of the study we just screened the kidneys or all to not to miss anything and uh, this is the T2 coronal of the abdomen. Here we, we could see that the kidneys were normal in size there was no hydronephrosis, no ureter dilatation. So there was no question of any ureterosil or ectopic insertion of ureterosil, those kind of uh, question because the ureter was having normal course. And uh, so those kind of things also were excluded. So now we were left with uh, a, a well-defined cystic lesion, which is hanging very thin wall, which does not have any fat. Like we, we had done some uh, fat set uh, signal intensity in those kind of sequences in which we rule out that there is no fat within the cystic lesion. So that also gave us confidence that this is not a, a case of teratoma. So we are looking at some cystic lesion, which is seen in relation to the right side of the vaginal wall. Uh, now it is not looking like some sort of obstructed hemivagina because the wall of the cyst was very thin and it was not looking like having vagina having wall or something like that. And the kidneys were normal. Uh, some cases of obstructed hemivagina can have renal anomalies. So those kind of findings were not there. And uh, the cyst was seen upper and mid part of the vagina. The lower part of the vagina and labia majora, those parts was not, not affected. They were looking normal. And then we did the literature search that what can happen in this location. So uh, in that, uh, one or two things which came out to mind, uh, it, which came on the research was this kind of uh, extremely rare case of a giant uh, Gartner duct cyst, which can be seen along the wall of the vagina, which happens uh, in the upper part of the vagina as compared to the lower part of the vagina. The other, other differential of uh, vaginal cyst like uh, Bartholin cyst and all, they occurs more of a lower part of the vagina and that is seen in old age group, not in a neonatal age group. And uh, they will be seen near the labia majora and those kind of location, which was completely normal in this patient. It was not looking like that. And uh, since it was averting the rectal wall and there was a USC possibility of uh, 
the duplication cyst we gave as a second possibility of duplication cyst but we were we were sure that this is not looking like just for uh, differential sake we gave uh, and based on this imaging finding that we could feel that this looks like more of a some sort of uh, a simple cyst which could represent a uh, vaginal gardner duct cyst those kind of thing so that was the our uh, interpretation no oh, excellent excellent interpretation uh, dr hiren uh, this yeah. was really fantastic. Even I understood what you were trying to say. Sure. Yeah, Thank I you just... so much. Yeah. Uh, you can unshare and Pooja, can you share back again? Uh, Dr. Rakesh, you've seen uh, Dr. Hiden's report. So what was your approach towards this feed, the neonate now? So the, the diagnosis basically rotated from maybe an anterior meningocele to a sacrococcal teratoma to a ovarian cyst and now we were kind of more or less zeroed on a paravaginal kind of a cyst which is compressing the rectum as you could see on the MRI. Right. That is what. Now I was, we were, and then of course Gartner duct uh, remnant or Gartner cyst you know can occur anywhere from the upper vagina into the pelvis also as we all know. So that was one of the things that came to our mind but there was a small cyst on the other side also. So it's some Wolfian duct remnant cyst, you know, something weird is what we thought of. So we decided uh, that because the rectum is compressed, we need to kind of attack it now. How, you know, we wouldn't like to wait. That was the idea. So we said we'll go for a cystogenitoscopy first. Then if required a laparoscopy, then if required a laparotomy and excise the cyst. As the cyst was thin walled, seated deep into the pelvis, I was not sure whether the whole cyst could come out, except we probably could marsupialize is what I thought. You know, I discussed with the whole team and with the parents also. So that's what we saw. So first we did a genitoscopy. Sorry, Pooja, this is not the one, the first one. Ah, okay. So the we are into the vagina. You can see cervix in the center, that's bingo. Okay. The entire vaginal right wall was concaving into the vagina completely. You know, it was completely coming inwards. And the left wall showed us this small cyst, pedunculated kind of a cyst on the left side. So we said that let's go into the abdomen and kind of deroof the cyst completely. So we went to the abdomen. Okay. Uh, bladder completely fine. Uterus slightly bulky but completely fine. Both the ovaries we can see, the right one and the left one there on the corner. So we lifted the uterus up, hoping that we'll find something between the uterus and the rectum. But unfortunately, <laughs> nothing was identified. No bulbs, no nothing. So we were wondering what to do. Uh, so we decided, uh, shall we dig into that uh, true pelvis, you know, open up the peritoneum and go in deep. But before that, we said, let's go into the vagina again and have a look at it. So we went back through the vaginoscopy. And in the vaginoscopy, we saw this bulge and we marsupialized the left, uh, the right cyst. This big hole you can see is the right uh, uh, hole in the right cyst, which we have made. And we could enter our scope right into it. A nice huge cyst with fluid, which was aspirated. Nothing very significant. And the left one, was not marsupialized, it was only aspirated. The left cyst, I don't think it is seen in this, but uh, uh, yeah, this left cyst was only aspirated. We got around uh, 1 to 1 1.5 ml of fluid from the clear fluid. We sent off for some testing, but it didn't really show us anything. We sent the walls of the cyst for histopathology, the right cyst. And the walls showed us that it is that uh, squamous epithelium and suggestive of Bartholin remnant or Wolfian duct remnant. This was it. Uh, the procedure and then of course the laparoscope was removed because we couldn't really help them with any laparoscopy. And then I think we repeated an ultrasound after a few weeks and uh, the cyst almost all disappeared. Zero. There's no cyst in the pelvis and no compression system. I didn't see the child about a few weeks later. After that I think Pooja or somebody must have seen the child. I'm not sure. No, that's that's really wonderful. I mean, coming to and zeroing down on Gartner's, yeah, beginning from a fetus is an 
exquisite case that we have discussed here. Extremely interesting, yeah. and the way it built up, you know, I yes, think the, the way the combined teamwork which right. helps us to reach this level of right. care of our patients. Yes, so I mean, uh, this is amazing. We um, all throughout probably Gartner was never in the differentials till uh, the MR came into picture and you put in a scope. So, um, so the key points from this is that all pelvic cysts, you look at the genitals, you look at the genitalia, not all pelvic cysts in the fetus will have an unfavorable outcome. But henceforth, you know, when you see a fetal cyst, which is simple, is not changing over time, is in that location where you can't fit into anything, do think of Gartner's as a differential. Not that it should be first on the card, but <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it should be uh, an eye opener, and that's why I, uh, you know, we wanted Pooja to share her case here. It's been an amazing journey. Thank you all. And the mm -hmm. final diagnosis was Gartner says the child is doing well, a very favorable outcome. Thank you so much, team. Thank you for your time. Guys. There's no, uh, there's no literature, yes. literature search on the fetal presentation no. of Gartner so far. Yes. We have had neonates. Uh, yeah. There are two, three neonatal studies coming yeah. up with three or four uh, giant Gartner's, as Dr. Eden said, but they will be the first fetal presentation. They will be never used to include this or never thought of this coming up as a differential. So this right. was a learning curve for all of us. Yes. Thank you so much, everybody. Indeed, and was fantastic work and by the uh, pediatric radiologist team in SRCC and the pediatric surgery team. Thank you so much, everybody. Right, Just to update Dr. Rakesh, the patient Not did follow up postnatally like after a month you. and three months. Uh, because they were sensible parents. They were, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, and uh, they were very our president, Dr. Tarvin, wants to comment something. No, 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 not comment. I just wanted to know if we had done a fetal MRI, would it have been of some help? I mean, if the parents have agreed for it. Probably Hiren can answer this better. Yeah. Hiren? Mm -hmm. Dr. Hiren? I mean, yeah, we could have done, but as they have already uh, discussed that the ultimate, uh, the course of the patient management would not have differed, I think. We would not have it might be a self assuring to the patient more that we are quite sure that what we are dealing with. Can I come in here? Yeah. As for a lot of fetal MRIs, first of all, parents are not willing, number one. And number two, most of the time, it tells you the same what the sonologist tells you, you know, mm. the antenatal sonography. It is almost identical. They look at the antenatal sonography report and extrapolate this. <laughs> I don't oh. know. This is mean my yes, no, 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 I think see, the, the reason why I asked that question is in the MRI, uh, here in, I mean, she has shown us very nicely the displacement of the vagina hmm. and the thick wall. Probably in some of the sections of the fetal MRI, I, I mean, I don't think uh, MRI people just take the ultrasound report and uh, type them up. <laughs> no, no. I don't agree with that. My experience so far. Yeah, Maybe no, we no. need to evolve yeah. on the antenatal MRI. That's what I say. But yeah. it's it's true that sir, uh, antenatal MRI, the image acquisition, it's a tough job. Uh, so you have to uh, correlate with your USG finding what you're finding. Yeah, then only, exactly what I was saying. Right? And then you have to make sense <laughs> that what we are dealing with. That that I no I can. But but is I won't I won't agree that uh, MRI is useless or something. Fetal no, MRI no. has its role. Has its role. <laughs> no, actually, of in course, fetal MRI abdomen, has. fetal abdomen MRI definitely has a role to play because yeah. uh, particularly in the third trimester, I think it does help in particularly this sort of a ambiguous situations where we are not very sure about the uh, nature of the cyst or nature of the space of pain lesion. And at the same time, based on the location, I think we can more and more focus to the various structures and the displacement of the structures could have given us some information. I mean, it's only an empirical thinking or a, uh, optimistic thinking. Yeah. yeah. I, I would request everyone to stay back for the questions. Maybe we'll take them at the end. But we move on to the second case. I invite Dr. Priya Deshpande to, to present our case. Dr. Priya is again a senior fetal medicine yeah. specialist practicing in Navi Mumbai attached to uh, Motherhood Apollo yeah, no, 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 no. Hospital. No, 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 no. She is the treasurer of the Association of uh, Fetal Medicine Specialists and she is a liaison for the uh, local area of Foxy for uh, all the academic programs. And uh, the moderator for this uh, session is going to be Dr. Bhimal Sahani. 
He is the president elect no, of no. the Society of Fetal Medicine. He is a post. Mohit, I think there is some confusion. Mohit, Mohit. Mohit, Mohit I think for this is Dr. Praveen. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. I, think, I think he got uh, carried away with MRI. No, no, no. I was uh, sorry. I know. It's uh, okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. Bimal and Praveen doesn't Dr. make Dr. TLN Praveen, I'm so sorry for this. Dr. TLN Praveen is a president of Society of Fetal Medicine. He is a radiologist practicing in uh, uh, Hyderabad for more than 35 years. A very senior fellow in the, known in the radiology circles, an excellent teacher, and is instrumental in uh, holding the uh, you know the, the ethos of Society of Fetal Medicine all throughout his tenure. So um, over to you, Dr. Praveen sir, to introduce your panel before Dr. Priya starts her uh, sessions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mohit. Um... It's indeed a great uh, pleasure to be with you all. And uh, it was really, really an excellent case uh, being presented by Dr. Pooja, as well as Dr. Hiren, and then uh, uh, the obstetrician and the surgeon. And uh, it's definitely uh, something which is very, very unusual, and it's a great learning uh, period. I mean, it's, uh, it was really inspiring. Great. And uh, then today, we are going to uh, take up one more uh, very rare uh, situation, that is the uh, fetal, fetal cardiac uh, tumors. Uh, and I have a wonderful panel with me uh, who, is a, uh, who are experienced in their own fields, particularly we have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sucheta, who is an obstetrician, lead obstetrician, and who is actually a consultant with uh, intra, a lot of interest in high-risk pregnancies. And at the same time, she is a, a trained fetal medicine specialist who has been handling her own patients. And then we have uh, Dr. Chin, uh, Chaitanya, who is a um, clinical geneticist as well as a metabolic geneticist, and who has been working at uh, Pune, uh, where at Sujana, as well as in the uh, uh, KEM hospital. Uh, and then we have Dr. Pooja, who has been working with, uh, who is a uh, fetal medicine specialist from Navi Mumbai, and he, she is the consultant at uh, Apollo Navi Mumbai, as well as uh, the uh, Hiran Lani. And we have Slok, who is, uh, uh, who is actually a friend of mine and who has been with us for some time, for about a year, as a Scholar MD student. And he has been doing extremely well, running his Slope Diagnostics as well as Sasvik uh, Diagnostic Center. And then we have the pediatric cardiologist, uh, Snehal Kulkarni. Uh, genuinely telling, I, I, I thought you were a male. <laughs> I'm sorry. But then uh, it was wonderful to see you and interact with you. And I think we need a lot of input from you regarding this uh, particular case. With this, I hand over the, um, the, um, this thing to Dr. Priya to take us through her case. Uh, yeah, good evening, yeah. everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. And the, the screen is visible. Slides are seen. Yes, yes, thank you so much. So I'll just uh, start with my case. Uh, a 31-year-old lady who was a gravid at two. Her previous child was uh, three years old and normal. There was no health issues. Uh, it, it was a non-consanguineous marriage. There was no significant medical history. This was a spontaneous conception. She had a first trimester screening done um, with ultrasound and all the markers along with the biochemical screen that is double marker. And the risk assessment was low risk. She came to me at 21 weeks and two days for a routine anomaly scan in which the fetal growth was normal, amniotic fluid was normal, everything was okay. The significant finding was there was a well-defined ecogenic intracardiac mass which was homogeneously hyperechoic and it was a single mass which was located in the left uh, ventricle and slightly extending anteriorly. I would just want to show you this clip. This is a cine clip of the 2D uh, imaging of the fetal heart and thorax. Here we can see uh, is, if my pointer is seen, this is the hy yeah. hyperechoic homogeneous well defined but it's not encapsulated as mobile and it's in the left ventricle. It uh, measured from around 8 to 8 by 6 millimeter in its widest dimensions. There was no, this is the outflow tract. This is the left ventricular outflow tract, which was free. And uh, it, it was not causing any obstruction to the inflows uh, or the outflows to the uh, fetal heart and the ventricles. And also there was no rhythm disturbance at this point of time. This image shows the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. They were also okay. So apart from this single lesion, there was no other uh, abnormality which was found in the fetus. 
And these are the arch views of the ductal as well as the aortic arch, and they were also clear. And the rhythm, as we can see, was normal and regular. So we uh, went ahead and did a detailed neurosonogram because we know that most likely this is a fitting into the diagnosis of rhabdomyoma. And we know rhabdomyomas are associated with tuberous sclerosis, and uh, these can show lesions in the fetal brain in particular. So a detailed uh, scan, that is the neurosonogram of the fetal head uh, and brain was done. And these are the images. This was the corpus callosum, the vermis, the midline structures, in particular, the cerebral uh, lateral ventricles and the uh, walls of ventricles. There were no um, undulations uh, found or there was no irregularity or a direct tuba which was found. So uh, in short, the detailed neurosonogram which was done was also uh, normal. So we counseled the couple that most probable diagnosis uh, clinically is a rhabdomyoma. And we did uh, offer her uh, invasive evaluation for genetic uh, testing because we had to, uh, we had tuberous sclerosis in our mind. And uh, she was advised to have follow-up scans every three to four weeks to monitor for progression, whether it's increasing in number and size. And of course, a genetic uh, geneticist consultation was uh, advised. However, the couple uh, understood everything, but they didn't opt uh, for amniocentesis. They went ahead, they had a growth scan somewhere else, and they came to us at 36 weeks one day. So this is after 21 weeks, I've directly seen her at 36 weeks. At this point of time, the fetal growth, amniotic fluid, Doppler, everything was okay. But now at this point, what I saw was that single rhabdomyoma, which was seen uh, at 21 weeks, was now, uh, in, it had increased in size and there were multiple uh, rhabdomyomas not only in the left ventricle but but also in the right ventricle and the left atrium and the largest one the one which I had measured before was now measuring 20 millimeters by 18 millimeter and there was one more which is measuring of the similar dimensions um, there was a finding which was the ventricular rate was 119 beats per minute and atrial rate was slightly high and I could find there were atrial ectopics in between. So that was probable, uh, probably because of so many supernumerary uh, rhabdomyomas uh, in the ventricular atrium as well as uh, ventricles as well as the atrium causing this disturbance. However, uh, surprisingly, there was no disturbance to the outflows, uh, uh, the blood flow in the outflow tracts. So these were the findings. This is a cine loop, and we can see uh, this is a 36 weeker baby and the four chambers. So the right atrium has had one or two rhabdomyomas. The right ventricle had four or five rhabdomyomas measuring around a uh, uh, dimension of nine millimeter to uh, 10 millimeters. And the largest ones were in the left ventricle, um, more to the anterior uh, wall of the left ventricle that we are seeing. And this is the other one, which is also as large enough. And it was exactly sitting in a left ventricular cavity. And I, as I had explained, this is the color flow uh, in the ventricles. And you can see how the inflows are fine. The filling of the ventricles is okay. And even in spite of so many, um, the uh, heart with pumping with some difficulty, the outflows were maintained. The larger rhabdomyoma, which is in the ventricular cavity, was just uh, in proximity to the outflow tract, but was not obstructing it. And this is how the outflow tract was filling. Uh, when the blood flow was crossing all across and uh, going and uh, uh, flowing properly. So this was the case. And then rest of the fetus was normal. We had seen this. Uh, now this baby again was counseled and we had again given her an idea. So she was delivered at a tertiary care center at Okulabian Hospital. And uh, it, it was a male baby, two year and one month old. Baby is doing fine. And there were no medications given. There was no active cardiac intervention done. So let's have a look at a few postnatal evaluation and reports. Uh, after delivery, there was a fetal echocardiography, which was done. Uh, first one was done just within a week of birth and then followed by uh, two months and six months. And all the uh, echocardiograms showed slow and gradual regression in the size of these tumors as well as numbers. And the biventricular function was good. It was maintained. There was no obstruction to the flows uh, any time, uh, even postnatally. And uh, again, there was no active cardiac intervention, which was required. This is an ECG, which was done at third month. And it showed a supraventricular biogemini. Then the neurosonogram. Uh, 
they did not opt i mean we had given an option of antenatal but although uh, antenatal mri again was not preferred by the couple so this postnatal neurosonogram was done as well as mri was done and both of them were reported normal there were no undulations or uh, subependymal uh, uh, or any even tumors seen so far so everything was fine uh, baby had uh, frequent atrial and ventricular ectopics as i had discussed but they reduced gradually baby had good weight gain there were no episode of seizures and ultrasound shows showed that the kidneys and brain were normal well plan for genetic evaluation where was again discussed postnatally even by geneticists at kokilabin but the couple has uh, it's still on hold they haven't done it yet the baby is now 1 year and 1 month old and he's doing fine so as steve jobs has told us if you haven't found it yet please keep looking so this is true in case of our evolving anomalies uh at least thank you puja it was wonderful and uh, can i share my uh, screen and if you unshare your screen then yes, i stop yeah um wonderful puja it was a great uh, uh, yeah. presentation and saran priya <laughs> and, uh, puja was the previous speaker i'm dr priya oh i'm sorry uh, priya priya i'm very sorry yes, extremely sorry okay now um uh, i invite my panelists uh, dr sucheta snehal as well as chaitanya and uh, slok and priya um priya has taken us through uh, a wonderful case of uh, uh, evolving uh, cardiac tumor initially she didn't find anything in in the 20 weeks scan later on she found one tumor uh, rhabdomyoma in the left ventricle gradually by 36 weeks she found multiple and that was the progress that was uh, seen and uh, unfortunately the couple did not agree for a mri of the fetal brain and uh, still i mean anyway uh, with all this background now let us try to evaluate uh, the various aspects of the fetal cardiac tumors as such we all know that the fetal cardiac tumors are very rare and the incidence is hardly about 0.25% in an infant but the detections are becoming more and more common because of the improvement in the technology as well as the ability to visualize the fetal heart in detail now with this background let me take you through the various aspects of uh, the pre, uh, uh, the fetal cardiac tumors now slok uh, could you please enumerate us the incidence of fetal cardiac tumors and what are the common cardiac tumors Slok, are you there? Hello. Yeah, I can. I? Yeah, please, please. Can I be audible? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So the cardiac tumors are particularly very rare, and they account for around point zero eight to two point four two percent in the antenatal life. Uh, the uh, cardiac tumors could be roughly divided into benign and the malignant one, of which the rhabdomyomas are the most common. Uh, benign tumors comprising around 60 to 70 percent. Then comes the uh, pericardial teratomas, which account for around 25 percent. Uh, fibromas and myxomas and hemangiomas account for the rest 13 percent. Of the malignant one would be uh, rhabdomyosarcoma and fibrosarcomas. So uh, these are the types of cardiac tumors which we probably would have encountered in time. so you made it very clear that the rhabdomyomas are the most commonest ones which we have to keep in mind and with this background priya can you please enumerate as you have wonderfully shown your case with multiple uh, uh, rhabdomyomas and here we have one other case where you can see that uh, there are uh, multiple uh, cardiac I mean, uh, uh, rhabdomyomas can you please explain the ultrasound features uh, for the benefit of our uh, listeners Uh, yes sir so as we've seen uh, that these uh, rhabdomyomas are homogeneously hyperechoic lesions and they may be single but uh, most often they are multiple also and they can be varying sizes uh, from 1 mm to as high as 40 mm as a, as what is reported in the literature we have seen a 20 mm one and they are homogeneous they are well circumscribed but they are not encapsulated and uh, they can be located anywhere close to uh, the ventricular walls or even uh, in close proximity with the av valves which can cause rhythm disturbances also may cause obstructions but uh, they can be found in any uh, area of the fetal heart yeah so with this background so basically we can find these uh, rhabdomyosas at various sites the most important thing is that when they are close to the av valves it results in regurgitations and when they are in the conduction sites then it results in conduction defects so with this background uh, priya what do you think about this this lesion what are the other lesions which you would consider when you have a space occupying lesion in the cardiac chambers uh 
uh, well, uh, so space occupying lesions in the cardiac chambers, well, the first common is DD, as we've known, is rhabdomyoma. But now the other common tumors can be fibromas or teratomas. Now, fibroma, again, is uh, it tends to be solitary and they tend to grow larger to larger sizes. And uh, teratomas, if we see, they'll have different components like solid and cystic components. So these are the differentials. And uh, now here in this case, we can see hydrox also, which has set in. Yes. Uh, and pericardial effusion has set in. Pericardial effusions are more associated uh, with uh, fibromas as well as teratomas. So that is one of the findings which aids in the differentials which we give. Yeah, this was one of my old cases. Uh, almost, I think it was in 1996 that I picked it up. And uh, then the, the child was operated. And of course, uh, they lost the child. But it was a pericardial teratoma with pericardial effusion, as well as you can see the plastering of the lungs on either side so because of the tumor, as well as the pericardial effusion that has collected there. Now, Dr. Sucheta, uh, the, as an obstetrician, uh, Priya has given you a diagnosis of rhabdomyomas. What do you expect or anticipate from this? Uh, what are the complications that you are, you are going to anticipate with these patients? Yeah, as uh, Priya has rightly said earlier the, and uh, told a uh, couple that usually they have a good uh, prognosis, it may regress. So majority of the patients, single rhabdomyoma, if it's there, we tend to tell patient that yes, it may regress eventually, either prenatally or after delivery, I mean, after the birth. But uh, if they increase in size or because of their location, they can sometimes create problem. So it can be totally asymptomatic uh, baby to there can be obstructive lesion and hence obstruction to uh, outflows. And because of this particular position, it can cause certain arrhythmias or conduction defects. So these are two main complications. Now, if they progress, because of these complications, eventually there can be cardiac failure or, you know, high drops. High drops. Fantastic. So these are all the kind of complications that we can anticipate whenever we have a cardiac tumor, which is commonly the rhabdomyomas. With this background, uh, can I ask uh, our pediatric cardiologist, uh, Snehal uh, Kulkarni, to enumerate about the conduction defects that can be expected? So basically, this is a tumor which arises from the ventricular myocardium. So the arrhythmias can come in which chamber the tumor is uh, located. If the uh, tumors are mainly in the ventricles, either right or left, we expect more of a ventricular extras system. If they are arising from the AV walls or a part of the any of the atrial wall, we expect more of a supraventricular extras system. So those are the kind of arrhythmias. But more than arrhythmias, we are always very worried about the outflow tract obstruction, which may eventually may result in severe obstruction and cardiac failure in this baby. Yeah. Thank you. Now, what are the associated abnormalities, slope, which you would like to anticipate in these patients with the cardiac rhabdomyomas? Uh, uh, so, tuberous sclerosis is the uh, is the association, is the most common association which we find with uh, uh, cardiac rhabdomyomas. Tuberous sclerosis is a neurocutaneous disorder in which you may be having uh, tumors or hematomas in various organs, right? From brain, you would be finding uh, lesions in the eyes, you would be uh, encountering lesions in the lungs, heart, uh, kidneys, as well as the skin. But the most important thing which we have to remember is that uh, antenatally, uh, during the uh, late second trimester, uh, you may be able to pick cardiac rhabdomyomas. But as far as the CNS lesions are concerned, uh, they come up quite late during the pregnancy, maybe around later after 28 weeks. So uh, uh, as far as from fetal imaging perspective is concerned, uh, uh, whenever we see cardiac rhabdomyomas during the anomaly scan, we have to keep a close follow-up and keep a scan uh, follow-up scan after four weeks and uh, keep a watch for the CNS lesions. Abnormalities, very nice, thank you. So basically, what we understood from this is that the commonest cardiac tumor is rhabdomyoma, and the complications that we can anticipate are outflow inflow tract obstructions, regurgitant flows, as well as conduction defects. More than anything else, whenever we have a rhabdomyoma, one thing we should constantly keep in mind is the possibility of a tuberous sclerosis complex. So these are the things that we need to uh, focus on whenever we find this sort of thing. Now, Slok, what is the incidence of tuberous sclerosis with uh, rhabdomyomas? 
uh, whenever we see a cardiac tumor, we if these are uh, single lesions, uh, the possibility of having an underlying tuberous sclerosis uh, may range around 50%. But whenever there are multiple, like if there are multiple lesions, then the uh, chances of tuberous sclerosis uh, uh, increases to around 90%. So, uh, um, uh, tuberous sclerosis, therefore, should always be uh, discussed with the uh, parents and the possibility of evolving CNS uh, lesions should also be discussed and therefore uh, uh, the patient should be given a clearer picture that you know, the lesions right now are only cardiac but probably we have to be on a watch out and uh, yeah so that uh, that has to be given. Very nice, very nice slope. That is a very good important message that you have conveyed that whenever we see a rhabdomyoma if it is a single, it is about 50% incidence of tuberous sclerosis. If they are multiple, there is almost more than 90% involvement of uh, brain. Because these lesions are the ones have, which have got a high penetration. High penetration in the sense it can involve various structures. As have seen, it can involve the retina, it can involve the lungs, it can involve kidneys, it can involve skin, it can involve brain. So most important thing is giving them a total picture in, during counseling, stating that this is what is going to can be anticipated because particularly a tuberous sclerosis. See, in the postnatal period, the rhabdomyomas may decrease, may completely spontaneously regress, but then the tuberous sclerosis will never do that. And at the same time, they will not be seen, but they can develop in future. That is the reason why we are always worried about the delayed neuro neurodevelopmental abnormalities. So keeping this in mind, can you please explain us the neurosonographic features of tuberous sclerosis? Uh, sorry, Priya. Yes. So, uh, in the neurosonogram, we look out for subapentival nodules, SCN, which we say, yeah. and also directly for the cortical tubers, if they are there in the cortex. So, yeah. these two are the ones which we look out for. And, uh, uh, yeah, so that's why we would want to do a detailed neurosonogram uh, whenever we see a rhabdomyoma. And also associated with it, would you like to see the kidneys also or no? Yeah. So, other organs which are involved, as uh, we've been discussing, are the kidneys. Kidneys can have polycystic uh, appearance or they might have angiomyolipomas and of course uh, they, there are other manifestations in the skin, the cafeole spores, the hypopigmented macules which yeah, are in the retina uh, there can be lesions. So these are the other organs which we but well antenatally if we are saying then we do look out for the neurosonogram I mean we do the neurosonogram and also uh, look out for kidneys in particular. Yes. There's a particular syndrome if I'm not wrong, bone wheel a syndrome which has a triad Yes. Uh, if we even have the kidney lesions seen. So. Yeah. yeah, put together all of them, yeah. Now, uh, Dr. Chaitanya, now we have uh, 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 more or less come to a conclusion that this is rhabdomyoma because that is the commonest cardiac tumor. And we know that there is an association with tuberous sclerosis. Would you please uh, enlighten us regarding the genetics of tuberous sclerosis? So as uh, rightly suggested, uh, about 80 to 90% of cases of multiple rhabdomyomas are likely to have a tuberous sclerosis complex. That's the earliest, but the issue is that all these tumors are going to occur quite late in gestation. So most of the times a prenatal diagnosis may not be sought. So whenever a patient is seen with a cardiac rhabdomyoma, a counseling is essential wherein we would also try to evaluate the parents for any minor features as such, because some of them may really escape without any major findings. So at least about one third of these patients are going to have a positive family history wherein one of the parents may be subtly affected. Two thirds of them could be a de novo uh, variant as such. So it's, it's an accidental occurrence. So it's an autosomal dominant disorder. So out of the two genes, so that there are two genes which are responsible for tuberous sclerosis, TSC1 and TSC2, rather TSC2 mutations are more common, uh, about 70% as compared to TSC1. Now, uh, the genetics of this is complex because in uh, usually they would present quite late in gestation. So an invasive testing usually is not opted for. But if in case somebody opts for such testing, ideally trio testing is what is essential. So wherein both the parents along with the fetus should be uh, tested. Otherwise, we will not be able to understand whether the variant is pathogenic or not. Because most of the time we get some variants of uncertain significance, which may be difficult to interpret in the antenatal scenario. Just to add one more point, I've had a couple of cases at least wherein the early findings of multiple ecogenic intracardiac foci was noted much earlier at gestation. So at around 20, 22 weeks, that was the finding which later evolved into a, a, a multiple rhabdomyomas. So in these cases, whenever there are large multiple ecogenic foci, sometimes counseling for a, a possibility 
of uh, these things may be warranted i think i think it is uh, uh, justified to ask for a triad uh, evaluation because the parents have to be evaluated in order to come to a conclusion whether it is an autosomal dominant because 30% of them are genetic 70% are de novo but still i think that that's an important factor no, addition to that would be there are deletions duplications which are also known so in about 5 to 10% cases of tuberous sclerosis there may be deletions duplications in the gene 90% of the mutations are sequence variants Big. and we usually review for it postnatally in about 15% cases you may not find a mutation in one of the tsc gene that is also a known fact so with considering all this always a trio testing helps in proper counseling yeah and then suppose in case if the patient now agrees for a, in the, in the postnatal period agrees what do you do how are you going to evaluate that usually in the postnatal period uh, essentially most of them we would counsel them first as regards to the possible complications uh, no investigations are really suggested at that point in time immediately you know we would just follow up their neuro development even then imaging as such other you know, in, uh, like mri as such it may not be indicated unless there are really symptoms which are appearing but we would keep a very close neuro developmental follow up with a geneticist a neurologist a pediatric neurologist and a geneticist we would follow the child up for various neuro developmental issues seizures autism in case seizures develop we may have to go for a, this thing but other invasive non invasive things like uh, usg of abdomen can be considered at periodic intervals skin lesions do not develop much early even in childhood you may not find skin lesions developing even the kidney lesions the ophthalmic lesions they develop quite late in life so sometimes screening for these at very periodic regular intervals in the pediatric age group may not be warranted okay thank you thank you very much hitani now uh, sucheta uh, what, what do you think about this uh, how do you evaluate this fetus presenting with cardio, uh, cardiac cardiac yes, cardiac but, but before, before that can i ask like if this patient would have agreed for amniocentesis because yes. she was my patient i'm just uh, curious to know yes, and i'm yes. speaking from patient side i know uh, understand in case she agrees for amniocentesis at that point of time when it was single rhabdomyoma lesion at 20 21. some weeks and uh, then uh, these genes were found you know then immediately next question what patient is going to ask should we discontinue the pregnancy uh, i think the counseling will be very appropriate stating that uh, see these are the things that which can uh, over a period of time lead to neurodevelopmental abnormalities such as the uh, such as having the seizures such as having autism so keeping these things i mean this is what we have to give the information to the patient uh, or the couple uh, and then the decision is uh, it is there because see uh, rhabdomyoma can uh, can disappear but then the tubers which have appeared will will increase and then this can cause a lot of uh, neurodevelopmental problems True, so sir. so in case uh, genetic evaluation suggests that presence of tsc1 tsc2 genes yes. in that case in that case uh couple is not wrong in terminating the pregnancy no no they are not wrong but then we cannot suggest that we will not direct them we only will tell that these are the various possibilities and the decision is theirs okay some of these patients can have really normal outcomes you have had tsc1 ts tuberous sclerosis proven patients who have had very good neurodevelopmental outcomes they may not have major complications also through the lifetime at but then how can we can we assure them about 20% 20 to 30% so that means it's a spectrum like it can be absolutely normal and yes, both us. or it can present at any time of life right. and we are supposed to just pass on this information to yes yeah uh, chaitanya sir i just have one same related question now in this point of time with our case when there are no other findings in this fetus and they are not very couple is not keen in uh, doing any further testing so should as a clinician should we still persist on them to get the testing done or we should wait to find for any uh, symptom to pop up correct what what, what should be our periodic ultrasound is just going to increase the anxiety of the patient and the child if child is doing absolutely fine developmental wise then why to screen you know so genetic counseling is what is definitely indicated in these cases so that we can discuss both the aspects then we leave it to the couple whether they would want to test or not usually this will be detected quite late in gestation wherein you know we cannot take major decisions based on the results so most of the results may be non actionable so you know in my with- case like now baby is 1 year old he had the rhabdomyomas have all re- re- regressed and there's no neurosonographic so for this couple what would be your advice now to to wait till we find a symptom or just yeah so for, for these couples also 
if there is a presentation, we would test the couple. We would give the option at the earliest so that we know whether we are dealing with a TSC1, a known mutation case or a mutation negative case. And if it's a mutation positive case, we will give them a plan of surveillance, you know, which they should. So it's more so a clinical surveillance that is indicated than any really invasive or, or you know, uh, testing as such. But I think the parent testing is very essential in this, in the sense, particularly when we have a child who is uh, a complete regression of rhabdomyomas, but there is no evidence of fibrous sclerosis. I think it is always better to test the parents so that we at least know their genetic configuration. Also, yes, probably tested, followed by the parental testing. If so, MLPA gone. is the test which is to be done? Mm -hmm. MLPA? Right. Sequencing, yeah. sequencing first because TSC2 mutations are more common uh, and almost about 70% will be, uh, about 80% will be picked up by sequencing. 10% will be picked up by MLPA. And on about 10-15%, you may not have a diagnosis. So though you have a very cl strong clinical presentation, you do not have a diagnosis because there are some genes which are yet unknown or somatic mosaicism. So wherein uh, the mutation could lie at the uh, you know, a, a skin biopsy and followed by uh, the testing of fibroblasts may sometimes help us in picking that kind of a mosaicism. Also, I would want to add one thing. Uh, as far as this pregnancy is concerned, the outcome has been good. But we have to always remember that by screening the parents, we would be paving the path for the for them to have a future uh, second sibling. So, uh, and they have to be uh, uh, insistent that they mention about these findings during their second pregnancy, so that the radiologist as well as the uh, gynecologist is uh, uh, so careful about. Yes, sir. In this case, she is a second gravida, and her first child is absolutely normal. So okay. should we consider this as you know the Dino. point Dino. 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 for the current pregnancy? The it's a de novo uh, yeah. thing. So the parents are relatively normal. Most of them see it's a hundred percent penetrant condition. So one or the other feature should pop up in the parents. So if you have done a basic skin evaluation, a retinal, and a USG abdomen, so that pick up a majority of of, of the uh, cases of TSC. Yeah. So only thing is that neuroimaging, whether it has to be done or not, is 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 really a Cost. So, okay, that's a wonderful discussion which we had regarding the genes and the genetic disposition of this thing. Now, let us. What is the prognosis, Lok? Uh, the prognosis is quite variable, as we had discussed in this case. Like uh, in Priya's case, the prognosis: uh, the child is completely normal. Uh, but uh, many a times, uh, uh, it might not be the case. Like uh, uh, approximately around twenty percent of the fetuses can develop complications. And whenever we are talking about complications, we have to remember uh, about how many uh, rhabdomyomas or cardiac lesions we are seeing, where they are located, uh, whether they are causing any hemodynamic disturbances. So majority of the complications are because of these, uh, like they would be refractory arrhythmias, they would be CCF, eye drops and still So uh, we have to give a clearer picture about these uh, possibilities to the parent. As well as we have to always remember that cardiac tumors though would decrease with the advanced gestational age, uh, but CNS lesions may increase in the size as the gestational age increases. So that thing also has to be remembered. And uh, uh, so if there are no in utero complications, then the possibility of having a completely normal outcome is very high. But when there are CNS lesions involved, then, then there would be severe neurodevelopmental delay. There would be autism. There is a possibility of epilepsy. Uh, many a times you might find kidney lesions or lung lesions which could be associated with renal failure or uh, pulmonary failure. So yes, uh, the complication rates are uh, uh, are definitely there, but it all depends about what is the presenting uh, imaging spectrum. And so that, uh, that plays a very important role in guiding the patients. Brilliant. Thank you. Very nice. Now, uh, Chaitanya, what is the recurrence expected? If uh, we have a classical presentation where it fulfills all criteria and we have found a pathogenic TSC1, TSC2 mutation in the genes and it is identified in the parents, the risk of uh, you know, recurrence is going to be 50%. Uh, but in almost about 60-70% cases, you are not going to find a mutation in the parents and the child is showing a mutation, parents, the mutation is absent. So it's a de novo 
variant which is there in the child. So usually in this case, we risk, discuss a risk of about 2 to 5%. You no, know, it is not a very small 1 to 2% germline mosaicism because recent studies have shown that at least about 5% cases could have a germline mosaicism. So in such families, 2 to 5% risk of germline mosaicism exists. And we can offer the couple the choice to consider invasive testing to rule out this small uh, 2 to 5% risk as well. Anyways, if they have a 50% risk, they will go for an invasive testing or a pre-implantation testing. But even for de novo mutation, the risk, we must be aware that it is a little higher than the other uh, routine autosomal dominant conditions with de novo occurrences. Very nice. Yeah, this is an extremely important message that we need to keep in mind while we are uh, evaluating these patients, particularly counseling them and offering them genetic evaluation. Now, coming to how do you manage them, uh, Snehal uh, Kulkarni said. Um, how, I mean, because we know that we may land up into obstructive lesions, we know we may land up into malignant apneas, and uh, we may know we know that we may redouble the, the fetus may develop high drops or significant pericardial effusion. How do you advise us to? I mean, how do you manage these fetuses? See, the management is usually required if there are intractable malignant arrhythmias, severe AV wall regurgitation, or severe ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which land up in severe heart failure. So these are the only uh, uh, indications for management. In a baby, usually surgical resection is never an option because they are part of the myocardium. They are not encapsulated tumor, so it's very difficult or impossible to take them out. So the management is only medical management. The drugs which are used usually is called as a serolimus or a tacrolimus kind of a group, which are called as a mTOR inhibitors. So they are basically immunosuppressants which we usually use after heart transplantation. And we have used in few patients which complete, they have to be given for a little prolonged period, maybe a couple of weeks or more than that, and keep on evaluating till the time they regress completely. Even there are reports of use, if they're used during the pregnancy also, if the fetus develops significant hype drops without many side effects in the mother. We have not used, but there are a few reports on that. And uh, the reports say that there can be complete regression of the rhabdomyomas, even if you use during pregnancy, especially if uh, it's causing severe outflow tract obstructions, AV wall regurgitation, or hydroxyl picture. So, how do you manage this malignant arrhythmias? The malignant arrhythmias, we have, if it is an atrial or a ventricular arrhythmias, we have to use our anti arrhythmic drugs to manage. Usually, we cannot manage because till the time your tumor is pressing the myocardium, the arrhythmias will be there. So the whole thing has to be, the whole treatment has to be to for reduction of uh, abdomyoma than mm -hmm. actually treating the arrhythmias because uh, they can't be controlled till the time something is uh, always irritating the myocardium or AV wall, the arrhythmias are difficult to control. Very nice. So basically what we need to do is to uh, have what is called as uh, virulimus or the serolimus therapy. So this serolimus is an inhibitor of uh, mammalian target of uh, rapamycin, that is the mTAR. So this actually is an anti-cancer drug and it's an immunosuppressant which is used for renal and uh, as well as in heart transplants. And uh, in tuberous sclerosis complex, uh, there will be a, what, what basically the pathophysiology is there will be an abnormal activation of the mTAR path pathway, which leads to increased cell growth as well as cell proliferation. So this serolimus is an inhibitor of mTAR. So mTAR pathway will be inhibited. In that way, it is going to arrest the increased cell growth as well as the cell proliferation. And it can also, as, as uh, 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 our pediatric cardiologist has, has suggested that serolimus can be used during pregnancy because it crosses the placenta, but there is the transfusion is transfer is usually unidirector, directional. Most important uh, side effect that we need to keep in mind is that it can result in hyperlipidemia or a diabetogenic effect. So these are the things that we need to keep in mind. And um, of course, the serolimus is the only therapy that has been uh, uh, used or experimented in, uh, uh, in uh, managing these uh, rhabdomyomas. Basically, as you said, unless the tumor size is reduced, either the obstruction or the regurgitation or the conduction defects cannot be controlled. So the basic thing is that to first and foremost thing to reduce the size of the tumor, then treat the uh, required, uh, I mean, uh, conduction defects or the, or the congestive cardiac failure. So with this, I think the key messages that we need to convey to the uh, audience is that the fetal cardiac tumors are rare. The commonest being the rhabdomyomas, which account to almost about 60% of the cases. 
they can be single multiple and can arise at any part of the cardiac cavity and it may be associated with arrhythmias and uh, um, with or with inflow or outflow tract obstructions or regurgitations when they are close to the av valves and rhabdomyomas are usually associated with tuberous sclerosis that is one thing which we need to keep in mind the incidence of tuberous sclerosis is only 50% if it is single if it is multiple it is more than 90% Uh, management is addressed by attempting uh, attending to arrhythmias but basically the most important thing is to inhibit the mtor pathway so that you can reduce the size and in turn uh, manage this arrhythmias or as well as the congestive cardiac failures i think with this we would end the panel discussion i, I really thank the whole panel for uh, really giving us a lot of inputs which really enlightened us because this is one of the rare situations that we come across in our practice that is the cardiac tumors um so with this i think thank you very much and thank you all the audience as well as the as dr mohit for giving us this opportunity it was wonderful sir thank the you uh, priya has presented and the way the build up of the panel the entire panelist team thank you so much thank you so much for a wonderful case presentation moving on to the third uh, we have dr kakuli boltakur who is a radiologist practicing at alti scans in washi she is passionate about fetal imaging and she is going to present her case on bowel obstruction and to moderate this case we have dr bimal sahani dr bimal sahani is the president elect of the society of fetal medicine he is uh, uh, the director of sonu scan center in aurangabad and uh, he is a course director of scholar md training program for fetal medicine diploma and he is more passionate about uh, fetal growth and fetal cardiac imaging so over to you bimal sir yeah good evening and uh, thank you mohit can you hear me yes 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, at the very onset thank you very much for having me for this uh, wonderful meeting here and uh, you know you people have started off great two wonderful cases case presentations and uh, special kudos to pooja and mohit for that first panel discussion it was an absolutely new concept where you had everyone who was involved with that case into the panel that was awesome because the fetal medicine specialist was involved in that case the obstetrician the pediatric radiologist as well as the uh, pediatric surgeon so this is a, a wonderful way of presenting it bimal yes, can i interrupt you uh, yes, vishal is trying to put the i think the uh trade videos or something i don't know i mean vishal was popping in no okay vishal i mean if we have a trade video you have a trade video or no uh yes sir we can play the trade video sir yeah please do so sorry vinay yeah yeah no okay welcome back and uh, so now i request uh, dr kakuli to share her screen and uh, you know take us through the presentation on bowel dilatation the case on bowel dilatation dr kakuli you can go on full screen yeah great we we are not able to hear you kakuli can you hear me now yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, good evening everybody at the outset i would like to thank the society of fetal medicine and nmogs for this wonderful opportunity to present before an esteemed forum Uh, i'll be presenting a case on fetal small bowel obstruction who presented for the first time in the third trimester as an evolving abnormality kakuli can you come closer to the mic please presented for the first time to us as an evolving can you hear me now sir better oh, yes thank you yeah uh, um uh 
Priming Gravida, 27 years, uh, presented to us at uh, four years back for a mid-trimester TIFA scan. Her menstrual age at that point of time was uh, 22 weeks, five day, uh, 22 weeks, and the corrected gestational age was 22 weeks, five days. There was no evidence of consanguinity, no genetic disease, and the patient had no history of any drug abuse or any coagulation disorder. The previous investigations, we had a dating scan at six to seven weeks, which was unremarkable. The 11 to 14 week scan was not done, and the quadruple marker at 18.1 weeks was screen negative. The TIFA scan showed us a normal fetal stomach. In fact, it was a little smaller in size and, and uh, there was no evidence of any ascites. There were no dilated bowel loops. Uh, we had also screened uh, for the trachea and the anus and everything because we do it as a routine protocol. All other structural abnormalities were checked for and there was no abnormality. The cardiac views were absolutely normal. Based on these findings, we concluded the TRIFA scan as a normal scan with normal biometry, adequate liker, and no structural abnormality. The patient was asked to come for a follow-up at 28 weeks, but however turned up at 35.1 weeks. At this point of time, we saw multiple dilated bowel loops. Uh, they were predominantly of the small bowel, bowel, uh, small bowel type. The hostrations were not seen and uh, uh, they were hyperperistalsics. The walls were thin. There was no evidence of any ascites. There was no evidence of any intraperitoneal mass and calcification. Uh, the bowel diameters measured between 18 to 23 mm in the long uh, axial section in a, in a wall. Uh, there was evidence of polyhydramnios, mild polyhydramnios with a single pocket depth of 9 centimeters. The stomach was distended but however situated on the left side of the abdomen. This is a synel loop to show the hyperperistaltic bowel loop seen at that point of time. We don't see any evidence of any bowel mass. We don't see any ascites and uh, they are clearly small bowel loops with no hostration seen. The biometric measurements at that point of time was absolutely normal. The abdominal circumference was little on the higher side. The fetal um, weight was above the 50th percentile and uh, the baby was uh, a normal, anatomically normally growing fetus and all the parameters were essentially normal. The Doppler measurements were also normal. With this, we came to a conclusion at 35, point, 35 weeks saying that this is an evolving abnormality which we had detected for the first time now, presenting with an increased abdominal circumference, dilated hyperperistaltic small bowel loops, a distended stomach, polyhydramnios, the large bowel was normal, no ascites, and there was no other structural abnormality in the fetus. We came to a diagnosis of small, uh, small bowel obstruction to be the most likely diagnosis. And uh, the patient was informed that this small bowel dilatation is a, uh, a small, is, uh, this, this is a small bowel dilatation which was not presented before and is presenting for the first time in the uh, third trimester. And this is an evolving abnormality not seen before. However, the prognosis remains guarded as the accuracy of prenatal ultrasound in determining the cause, the associated abnormality and also the um, uh, multiplicity of the lesions could not be predicted on this uh, ultrasound findings and so the prognosis could be only determined on the postnatal evaluation. If an isolated small bowel obstruction, the patient was told that it usually has a good prognosis. The patient was made aware of the possibility of complications like ascites, meconium peritonitis, uh, meconium pseudosis and advised a weekly follow-up. The patient was informed the possibility of a premature delivery, the possible need of surgery in the immediate postnatal period was indicated, and the prenatal surgical counseling was uh, uh, asked to be taken from a pediatric surgeon. The patient was advised uh, and insisted uh, to be uh, the delivery to be done in a tertiary care center. The patient, however, uh, went to a peripheral hospital and delivered the baby at 38 weeks. It was a cesarean section. The indication was premature rupture of membrane. The baby cried at birth uh, and had a distended abdomen. The baby refused uh, feeds and was vomiting and lethargic. In the same place, they did a plain x-ray of the abdomen, which showed uh, dilated uh, bowel loops, uh, which of predominantly of the small intestinal type. The, there was no distal air, there were uh, air fluid levels, and there was no evidence of any perforation. 
the baby was shifted on the third post operate uh, third day, uh, day of delivery to a tertiary care center put on parenteral nutrition uh, the surgery was done on the fifth day and uh, it was diagnosed to be a single segment proximal ileal atresia and a jejunal ileal anastomosis was done. Uh, the baby's uh, post recovery, post surgical recovery period was uneventful and was discharged on uh, the 15th post operative day. Uh, today, the baby is four years old and doing very well. With this, I would like to thank you for a very patient <coughs> hearing. Thank you, Dr. Kakuli. Can you unshare your screen, please? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we come down to evolving, uh, uh, you know, little discussion on bowel dilatation as a part of an evolving anomaly. In fact, the theme today has is uh, on evolving anomalies, anomalies that uh, either become apparent or uh, they are seen only in the uh, third trimester. And uh, I have a wonderful panel here. Uh, we, I have, we have Dr. Anuvij, who's a senior obstetrician from Navi Mumbai with a special interest in fetal medicine. So, you know, she's going to give us a little bit of the, as a clinician's insight, as well as uh, being a fetal medicine person, she'll be a part of the other discussion also. Then we have Dr. Anita Bajaj, who is a consultant radiologist at the Apollo Hospitals, Navi Mumbai, and trained in fetal medicine. So again, uh, you know, involved with the fetus more, uh, you know, commonly. Then Dr. Ashwini Rati is a fetal medicine consultant, and uh, she is, uh, uh, you know, she's done her fetal medicine from Apollo Hospital, Delhi. She's got a lot of presentations on her name. She's received a lot of awards and she's the director of the Mumbai Fetal Medicine Center. And then we have Dr. Hemant Lahoti, who is uh, MCH Pediatric Surgery Professor and Head, Department of Pediatric Surgery, Dr. D.Y. Patil Medical College, Navi Mumbai. And lastly, of course, Dr. Kakuli, who's been already introduced by uh, Dr. Mohit Shah. And uh, she's undergone uh, a special uh, you know, training program from the Scholar MD Fetal Medicine She's done, she's an alumnus of Scholar only. So anyway, we are all very proud of her. Now, you know, we, anomaly detection. See, we, when we talk about anomaly detection, we used to talk about the 20 week scan, then we moved on to the 11 to 13 week scan. And uh, that is a part of routine evaluation for every time. But the clinicians and patients, they all expect us to give a very conclusive answer by the time of the second trimester TFA scan, whether everything is normal or abnormal. But, you know, in spite of whatever efforts you do, however experienced you are, however well-trained you are, how much ever at the time you're ready to give, there are many surprises in terms of evolving anomalies, which, you know, you may come across when you are doing a fetal growth assessment. Because, see, uh, uh, everything has an embryological timetable. See, the fetus, uh, most of the parts are ready by the 20 weeks time, but the fetus is still growing. Pregnancy is a dynamic thing. These are all things which we need to know, and we can't hasten embryology. Now, if just to the two studies to show you that, if, you know, this was one uh, last study where they found out that in the third trimester, 15% of the anomalies were picked up in the third trimester and postpartum 10%. So till second trimester, they could pick up only about 85, uh, you know, 75% of the cases. This uh, last study from the Nicoloids group with 52,400 singleton pregnancy, the 24.8, nearly a whooping 25% were picked up for the first time at the 35 to 37 weeks and 7.4% uh, in the postnatal period. Now, it is very important that we, in fetal medicine, the obstetricians who are treating the patient, the pediatric surgeons and the pediatricians who are eventually going to uh, manage these babies with, uh, you know, uh, 
did, anomalies detected later, we all should be aware of it so that we all speak the same language. And uh, uh, amongst all these anomalies, you will find that gastrointestinal system, the GI anomalies are one of the common anomalies which manifest later in pregnancy. And uh, amongst them, the obstructions are one of the common things. So now, see, Takuli has taken us through a case where the second trimester, everything was normal. And then the patient comes for a growth scan and boom, and you keep the probe and see, you can see multiple dilated bowel loops there. Now, uh, Dr. Ashwini, is this a common scenario with intestinal obstruction? And if so, why? Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah you are. All right. Okay. So, um, yes, it is a common scenario with uh, intestinal obstructions. Uh, essentially, as everyone has highlighted here, it is an evolving pathology. So it is going to take that much time for the uh, constricted stenotic segment to have the effects in the proximal uh, bowel loops to dilate and to show up by the end of the third trimester. So which is why the uh, GI obstructions uh, will not show up in the second trimester. Second trimester, the only thing we could probably look at and guess that it could come up is an ecogenic bowel. But by itself, an ecogenic bowel in the second trimester is very non-specific, meaning it could be a marker for your downs, it could be a marker for your infections, for cystic fibrosis, for IUGR. So only thing that we will know in the second trimester that will probably alert us to an obstruction later is an ecogenic bowel. Otherwise, the nature is going to take that much time. As Sir said, embryology will take its time for the bowel loops to dilate. And it is quite common, the proximal jejunal and the distal ileal obstructions, 30 to 40% of them will uh, be diagnosed in the third trimester only and the remaining postnatally. So not in the second trimester. Uh, you you made a, a very va valid point that you, you know uh, the ecogenic bowel the ecogenic bowel is at times can be an early presentation of an impending bowel obstruction hmm. so that is something even when we counsel a patient with ecogenic bowel we do say that yes so every time you see an ecogenic bowel you see to it you get the patient back after four to six weeks thank you very much Ashim, for that now uh, uh, Dr. Anita, what is the diagnostic criteria to call a bowel dilated? When do you call it dilated? And uh, on seeing dilated bowel loops, can you differentiate whether this is a small or large bowel? And how do you do that? So basically, for a small uh, bowel, the diagnosis, the upper limit is seven millimeter, um, in the, and the length is about fifteen millimeter. That is the cutoff. And for the large bowel, it is the, there is a normogram. In fact, the large bowel loops uh, can vary a lot of to a different extent, and the range is from fourteen point five to about nineteen point four. So anything about twenty mm is dilated. That is the normal range. And average bowel diameter do, normally do not exceed small bowel diameter. Never exceed seven millimeters. So that's the cutoff. And of course, we can differentiate with the better equipment and with the, with the better transducer, we can differentiate a uh, small bubble from the large bubble with few, basically the position, the small bubble loops are located more centrally and in the pelvis. The large bubble is more peripherally located, going along the flanks on both sides, the ascending and the descending colon and the transfers <laughs> going below the liver and the stomach and the sigmoid joining arches behind the bladder and uh, goes and joins the rectum. So that's how, and the hostile markings in the large bowel uh, help us in differentiating it from the small bowel. Nevertheless, they, when everything is more dilated, sometimes it's a, you know, you can still get confused whether it's a small or the large bowel, but to a certain extent, yes, we can. Yeah, to a certain extent, yes, looking at the location and all, but then still quite a few times, it may be difficult to differentiate between the two. And uh, this point that you try to make is that if you, because normally the small bowel is very, very curled. And so if you're seeing a single large 
if you're seeing a single segment which you can measure it and that is greater than 15 millimeter think that there is a bowel dilatation and then of course there is a complete normogram this is a 2020 study which has come that is and large bowels are slightly hypoechoic also as compared to the small yes relatively now uh, dr anuvij what are the causes of dilated bowel loops once you see dilated bowel loops what are the causes and then you know what else should you look for in the abdomen on seeing a dilated bowel loops uh, the causes basically are um, obstruction which can either be mechanical or it can be functional in the area of the bowel um, obstructive causes can be the stenosis or the atresia and uh, there can be meconium uh, obstructions also. There can be a volvulus malrotation. The functional causes uh, can be the because of the aganglionosis and uh, other causes like um, uh, the pseudo obstruction, which is associated with megacystis, and uh, as you have listed, congenital chloride diarrhea and microvillus. And all these causes are seen more in cases where the mother is having certain drugs which can cause vasoconstriction, like uh, she is on antihistamines or decongestant medicines, or she is taking some medicines for um, the migraine headaches, cocaine, more on caffeine. And then there can also be uh, part of the APLA syndrome, which is known for causing um, the thrombosis. So we have to look into that aspect also besides this. So once we have seen a dilated large bowel, we have to first rule out whether it is a isolated um, entity or there are certain other associated features along with it, like uh, the polyhydramnios or the fetal ascites, or there are signs of uh, bowel rupture or fetal uh, the meconium echogenesis in the fetal. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thanks a lot. Now we move to the next. Uh, Dr. Kakuli, uh, can you differentiate between jejunal and ileal obstruction prenatally? And uh, yes, is it really important? How do we do it? Uh, there are certain pointers from which we can differentiate between the jejunal and the ileal atresia. However, there could be a mixed presentation, which is in my case. Uh, coming from the incidence wise, the incidence of jejunal atresias are more common than ileal atresias. The, uh, coming on the ultrasound examination, when we go from top to the bottom, the uh, stomach distension is more marked in cases of uh, jejunal atresia. The dilatation of bowel loops are more marked in cases of jejunal and uh, a little minor in cases of ileal atresias. Uh, ascites is usually rare uh, in cases of jejunal atresias, but more <coughs> common in cases of ileal atresias. Polyhydramnios is more pronounced in cases of jejunal atresias and rare in ileal atresias. Perforations are more common in jejunal, less in ileal. And associated abnormalities, if we go, then they are more frequent in cases of uh, jejunal atresias and rarer in ileal atresias. But however, in this case, we had a proximal ileal atresia. So we had a very mixed presentation wherein we couldn't differentiate between a jejunal and a proximal ileal atresia. Thank you. Now, your case, you know, because you've done that, that is your case, you've seen it. Now, in that kind of an appearance, uh, and see, Dr. Anuvij has taken us through a complete list of what could be the causes of uh, this thing. What is it you feel could be the closest differential diagnosis? Uh, the first pointer to me was whether that whether it is a small the dilated bowel loops were predominantly small bowel loops. So uh, of course we considered the case that uh, the two most common things which I thought of is one is of course a jejunal or an ileal atresia. And the second thing being the commonest is Hirschsprung's disease, though it usually presents in the colon and we get the large bubble loops dilated. But sometimes we could also have a anglionosis, which presents the proximal uh, colon or the small bowel also, and could also have a similar presentation. But uh, the one more, these two are surgical management cases, but we had also considered the rare possibility, which is a case of congenital chloride diarrhea. This is a rare presentation wherein we get multiple dilated bowel loops, which are of both the small and the large bowel types. The peristalsis would be a little less. 
the abdomen will be hugely distended much more than what we had seen and the typical posture the baby assumes which is uh, like a frog like presentation is the term used for that wherein we get the legs and hand extended because the baby has a hugely distended abdomen in this case as we see here we get a little thickened bowel loops which is a peculiar characteristic of this uh, the uh, polyhydramnios is also present in this case, but however, uh, in this case, the hyperparesthesis is not as common as we uh, think in, in cases of small bowel atresias. But this was also kept in mind because uh, this has a uh, predilection towards a certain racial predilection and it's no, not common here. It's more common in places like Finland and Middle East cases have been reported and it's an autosomal recessive disease. The mother usually presents with uh, hypertension and uh, uh, certain other uh, there's a family history which is to be noted of uh, in this case which was absent in my case but this was also considered as the closest differential diagnosis because this is managed medically and requires immediate attention uh, the baby requires immediate attention in the immediate postnatal period for a better survival and see one one uh, you know good diagnostic criteria is you have to look at you know keep the probe on yes. near the perineum and watch and you could see a constant frequent streaming frequent motion streaming there of, uh, because motion the, in the yeah, because yeah. diarrheal stool passage happens and then one differentiating point is you won't find meconium peritonitis in this peritonitis and there is no ascites and uh, yeah this case actually was Ascite. diagnosed as small oil obstruction postnatally turned out to be that uh, Dr. Heyman, how is the prognosis of prenatally diagnosed jejunal ileal atresia? Because we would like to know because the first we are the first people who counsel the patient and, and the patient would probably ask us. So what do you suggest us? How, how the, is the prognosis overall in such cases? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Are you able to hear my voice? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, before I answer the question, let me thank uh, my colleague, Dr. Kakoli. Uh, for this opportunity and also congratulate all the faculty for brilliant presentation. Um, now, uh, theoretically, the antenatal diagnosis of an anomaly should improve the prognosis. However, in case of ileal atresia in clinical practice, it's not a prognostic indicator. Prognosis of ileal atresia actually depends upon three main factors. One, the maturity and the weight of the baby at birth. Uh, baby near term with good weight should have a better prognosis. Second is associated major systemic anomalies, especially cardiac ones and the genetic abnormalities will have negative impact on the prognosis. And third is the type of atresia, wherein apple peel type of atresia, which is type 3b and multiple atresias type 4 will have worse prognosis. Overall prognosis, however, is good with expected survival of more than 80% babies if they are diagnosed early and treated properly. So in a tertiary care setup, it doesn't matter if the ileal atresia is diagnosed prenatally or not because the system is in place. However, in a semi-urban or rural area where high-end medical facilities are not available, the diagnosis uh, allows for transfer of the pregnant woman to a higher center uh, for delivery. And I think that should increase uh, the chances of survival for the given baby. Dr. Hemant, one more question. Uh, this, uh, if this patient has been sent to you for prenatal counseling, and uh, would you advise the obstetrician uh, to deliver this baby early or let this pregnancy go on to full term? No, sir. We must allow the pregnancy to go on to full term. As I said, one of the one of the prognostic indicators is the maturity and the weight of the baby. Smaller the baby, worse is the prognosis because they don't tolerate anesthesia and surgery as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, you know, an early delivery and getting the baby out early no, no. and that we can no, manage sir. it early really does not uh, matter in this kind of case. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hemant. Now, uh, Dr. Anita, which are the other GI abnormalities that become apparent in the late second or third trimester? Uh, the, there are lots of GI abnormalities which become apparent actually in the late second and third. It's opening like a opening of a Pandora's box. So starting from esophageal atresia to tracheoesophageal fistula to esophageal, esophageal stenosis, esophageal duplication cysts, 
the intestine, the anal atresias, the diaphragmatic hernias, which sometimes are detected a little late. Most, some of the good amount of diaphragmatic hernias we are able to detect earlier on. Then there are a lot of abdominal cysts like duplication cysts, the mesenteric cysts, the omental cysts, hepatic cysts, splenic cysts, and in and uh, certain um, vascular like umbilical vein barracks um, and all the organ liver tumors. Uh, which are rare, but those can be picked up. So all these are evolve, evolve uh, around the second and third trimester, and there are nightmares <laughs> when you detect them oh. later in there. And then now, from today onwards, we can add Gartner's cysts to that list. Yes. Of <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Ashwini, uh, not pertaining to this case as such, but among these GI abnormalities, uh, you know, because uh, as uh, Dr. Anita has pointed out, most of them would be picked up later. Uh, some of them have a strong genetic association and require genetic testing. Now, is it justified to do a genetic test in the third trimester? I'm not saying this 35 weeks, this case, but in general, maybe you say about 30 weeks, 30, 28 weeks, 30 weeks by the time you pick it up. And then how will the information from genetics uh, change patient options, delivery decisions, and postnatal care in such cases? All right. So the, um, your question is divided into three parts. So I'll take each one of them. So first is which of the GI abnormalities that present in the third trimester have a strong genetic predisposition? So the most common one here that we are focusing on is cystic fibrosis. Uh, so cystic fibrosis can be associated uh, with this kind of a picture. On the ultrasound, it would look slightly different. The walls would be a bit thicker, more ecogenic. The, there would be a meconium peritonitis kind of picture with the uh, grainy ascites and the pseudocyst formation. Uh, but whenever we are discussing uh, the non-duodenal uh, small bowel obstruction, then we are talking about cystic fibrosis and we have to offer the genetic tests to the couple for the most common, the Delta 508 uh, mutation. Uh, second question, second part of that question was whether are we justified at, you know, offering that at 30 weeks? Uh, my answer would be an unequivocal yes. Uh, we must offer them at whatever gestation uh, they come to us at. Uh, third, we'll answer why, as in how will that change anything? So how that will help us is, it will help us uh, not in terms of whether we can terminate or not terminate, which is what you know the entire discussion hangs around. Even if we're not talking in terms of uh, whether we can terminate or not terminate, it can help us plan well in advance uh, make the couple aware of what is going to come. Uh, also plan the mode and the timing of delivery and help her to shift into a uh, tertiary care sort of a setup if required. And then they can get in touch with the uh, neonatal team and things like that. So whenever uh, we have a chance, uh, we should offer the genetic tests, especially for cystic fibrosis if we are talking of uh, bowel obstruction and that will help us in preparing the couple for what is coming next. As far as small bowel atresia is concerned, it is cystic fibrosis that we need to think for because association with aneuploidy is low and uh, yes, <laughs> if it is a duodenal atresia, we, if we know it has a very strong association with trisomy 21 and if you, even esophageal atresia can be associated with trisomy 18 and trisomy uh, 21. Thank you Ashwini for that uh, you know very very uh, point you know a very message oriented answer. Now uh, Dr. Anuvich uh, with your in your vast experience uh, you must have come across a situation like this where you have a patient has undergone a second trimester scan, everything was normal, everything is happy, happy. You send them for a growth scan and they come back to you with a report of, like in this case, an ileal atresia. Now, how do you handle this situation in practice? How, how do you cancel this? Uh, how do you counsel this patient now? So obviously, once the patient gets uh, this shocker of a report, she is going to come back and she's going to ask, like, you have been doing all my scans. 
and you have been counseling me that everything is okay, nothing to worry, but now this comes up. How did this happen? Where we missed or where we went wrong? So the first thing which needs to be told to the patient is okay, nobody has gone wrong anywhere. This is an evolving anomaly. This would never have shown at the 22 or 20 week scan. It makes its present for the first time in the third trimester according to its timeline of appearance. So it has to be seen at that time only. So we have not been wrong anywhere. And the positive thing which you have in your report is that this is a isolated problem. There is no other associated feature which can suggest that this is something more complicated than what it appears to be. So this has to be seen as a you know, line, silver lining in the black cloud that you have a problem which is isolated. And the other thing I would like to counsel the patient is that if you see the dictum, if the anomaly is more gross, more severe, it appears early in the pregnancy, like first trimester or second trimester. Now your baby is showing this anomaly in the third trimester points to the fact that this may not be that gross or that severe. Um, at that point of time, on my level, I would like to see <clears throat> that uh, since it is isolated, the prognosis is little better vis-a-vis -vis if the patient had certain other associated features like fetal ascites, polyhydramnios, and other uh, features. Now, the second point of counsel will be the need of serial scans, maybe weekly scans, to see how these bubble loops are behaving, whether they, their dilatation remains as such, or they are increasing, or hydramnios is appearing, making its appearance now after a week, or there is fetal ascites, or signs or symptoms of bowel rupture, etc. And we have to do this serially, maybe uh, weekly. Uh, the third point is the place of delivery and uh, the consultation with the pediatric surgeon who is going to handle this baby. The final prognosis will be given in concert with the pediatric surgeon who is uh, going to handle this case and who has more experience vis-a-vis -vis me to give uh, uh, to prognosticate this case. Uh, the third, sorry, the fourth thing would be the uh, injection steroid because she is around, I think, 31, 32 weeks. There may be preterm delivery if she develops polyhydramnia, so we have to look after that part also. If she goes into a preterm labor, the neuroprotective max self has to be given. That also has to be mentioned in the paper because she may not deliver with me. She may go to a um, higher center or tertiary care center where she's going to deliver. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate when you said that, uh, you know, I will first tell them that, yes, this would not have been picked up because there have been cases where, uh, you know, people have just, uh, when the patient asks them give, why, they send them to the person who had done the second trimester scan and they say, oh, go and ask him, he's done the second trimester scan, why it was not picked up. And that leads to the whole uh, uh, issue. And hence, it's very important that everyone, it's not just the people involved, like you are fortunate, you're involved in fetal medicine, you're doing your scans, but a lot of clinicians do not, are not aware that yes, a lot of these actually could be picked up in the third trimester. And that is the reason this wrong, uh, you know, uh, maybe not intentional, unintentional statement comes out, you know, which leads to a lot of medical legal <laughs> issues later on. Uh, Dr. Heyman, now most of these GI obstructions are not diagnosed uh, in the second trimester. How much does a precise prenatal diagnosis, maybe even in the third trimester, even 37 weeks, have an impact on postnatal management? This You have partly answered this before. And then how does involving a pediatric surgeon in the antenatal period help in improved postnatal outcomes? Um, so, see, it's true that atresias are diagnosed late. As other experts have already said, it, prenatal scanning has low specificity, low sensitivity, and a very high negative, false negative rate. Um, in fact, more than 50% are not diagnosed prenatally. But I'll tell you what I tell the uh, parents during counseling. Uh, it's not necessarily such a bad thing that you didn't diagnose it because um, one, atresia are not what you call as fire brigade emergency, that you deliver and take the baby to OT. No, it's not like that. 
most of them are operated between two and four days. Secondly, the diagnosis beyond the legal limit of abortion means the baby actually gets delivered and gets a fighting chance at life. So uh, to the obstetricians and radiologists who are worried about not diagnosing and all that, I, I don't think you should be worried about it at all. It's all right that you didn't diagnose. Um, see, I, I, I believe prenatal diagnosis of ileal atresia or any other anomaly for that matter offers one clear advantage and that is ability for the parents to prepare prepare themselves physically, emotionally, financially, logistically for the delivery and the treatment of the baby. And it is in this preparation that prenatal counseling helps a lot. Uh, it's obvious and proven by a number of studies that you should involve your pediatric surgeon early in the process. Um, it, it, it's logical that uh, prenatal counseling for a surgical anomaly should be done by a person who is actually going to operate upon the baby um, because Counseling is not merely transfer of information. If that were true, any person with a smartphone and a data pack probably has more information than all of us combined. Um, prenatal counseling is an art. In addition to giving the relevant information about the disease, the options, the prognosis, um, it includes um, understanding and addressing the concerns, fears, anxieties of the parents and helping them to make a correct decision for themselves and more importantly for the baby. Other thing is operating on an ileal atresia as a neonate is not a one person's job. You know, you need a team of experts from neonatology, anesthesia, obstetrics, nursing, who kind of make that baby, make the surgery success. And the pediatric surgeon, if involved early, can have these people ready when the child is delivered. So, yeah, yes, go ahead. You involve your pediatric surgeon early in the process. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Heyman. Now, this is just want to tell everyone, see, whatever we talk about, the patient will ask one question, why was it not picked up early? Correct. That is the only thing. Sometimes they will not even ask what is the prognosis. All these questions come later. The only thing is, why was it not picked up early? And hence the counseling, you know, even the person who has picked it up has to be, you know, there should be no hurried counseling. Okay, I've given the report, go and speak to you. You don't, you know, you have to give some time, sit with the patient, talk to the patient, tell them and do not criticize the colleague. That's very important. If somebody else has done the second trimester scan, please do not say who's done the second trimester scan. Uh, was it reported earlier? All these kind of even questions asked unintentionally lead to a lot of problems. And then everyone, the imaging specialist, the clinical obstetricians, and the pediatric specialist all should speak the same language and that will prevent any other thing. And then I would like to say that, you know, it's very important that we keep, uh, you know, this is a list from Paladini's book, which are the anomalies which are uh, always seen in the third trimester in a significant, you know, this kind of material you should have, you should have because when the patient talks to you, asks you, or is asking you again and again, then you can always show them some scientific evidence. You see this, this is all, this is what literature is all about. You keep all those things ready. And so to conclude, counsel parents, it's important that that is the reason that when you're doing a second trimester scan, you should at the end of the scan, uh, of course, reassure them everything is normal, but always put in a sentence or something and counsel them that if they keep asking you again and again, everything normal, everything normal, everything normal, please say that yes, as of today, everything is normal. But yes, there are certain things which can evolve later. This should be also documented in the report in the form of a disclaimer. I don't know how much medical legally it helps, but the, at least the patient uh, reads it and knows that there is something which can happen. Third trimester scans are not just growth scans. That's very important. Now, most of the time, they, you know, even uh, the, uh, the reference comes as a routine scan. There's nothing called routine scans in obstetrics. So all growth scans, you have to give some time to look at all these evolving anomalies. And this should be a part of it. You may detect previously undetected structural anomalies. And then all this picking this up can really make a difference as far as the management is concerned. And there are still a few anomalies that would be diagnosed postnatally. And that is also something which we all should be aware of. Forget the patient. We'll make the patients aware later. 
I, I think the first job in the next one or two years is to see to it that everyone right from the pediatric segment to the uh, uh, clinical obstetrician and the imaging, every one of us should be aware that yes, there is a decent chunk of anomalies which would be picked up in the third trimester. Thank you, my uh, you know esteemed uh, panel. All of you have been wonderful. Yes, madam, you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to ask one question. Um, uh, FGR is quite common in these type of situations, especially the late onset FGR. Now the AC is usually around 95th centile because of the mechanical distension. And uh, BPD and uh, HC is around, in this case, it was somewhere uh, less than 50th centile. So how will we diagnose or how will we take into consideration to diagnose the FGR? Yeah, Madam, we would all see, we will take use of hemodynamics here. You may not mm -hmm. have the fetal weight. And anyway, when we talk about late onset FGR, uh, late onset FGR could be AGA, may not necessarily be an SGA. And that is the reason, at least I have been promoting the use of Doppler in every growth scan. And I think, because anyway, based, based on the size, we are not going to take any decision, but yes, based on the hemodynamic changes, and hence the Doppler there would really help us whether this baby is going towards uh, an FGR. Yeah, because then we have to decide the time of delivery for that. Exactly, baby. yeah. Time of delivery would be decided. Because everything could be, because there could be a polyhydramnios because of this lesion that would prevent an oligo, which would have otherwise occurred. So yeah. that, that mix, mix bag is- Mixed picture, yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of overlap is seen. Yeah, so hemodynamics is the thing which is going to help us here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks thank a lot, you. everyone. Uh, with that, uh, back to Dr. Mohit Shah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bimal. Thank you, all the panelists. Again, all three cases, wonderful discussions, wonderful buildup of cases. I mean, so much to take home. Uh, uh, but we, we have a lot of questions there that uh, pertain to your panel. Most of the previous questions seem to be answered. So what is the relation between APLA and bowel obstruction? And why would you stress on coagulation abnormalities in a patient? Would uh, you want APLA to usually causes uh, intravascular uh, thrombosis. So if there is mesenteric thrombosis by any chance, that part of the, the, mes the colon is going to be um, uh, suffering the injury of hypoxia. It can lead to either mechanical obstruction or the aganglionic segment for that particular part. So this is important. If we see a case of uh, bowel dilatation, we have to go back right up to the history taking part and see if there is any history of autoimmunity in the family or in the patient. And then that may be a pointer uh, towards the APLA antibodies and that causing uh, thrombosis. Hmm. So can we also detect pyloric stenosis in prenatal period? You cannot make a definitive diagnosis of pyloric stenosis in the prenatal period. Yes, you will. You can see a distended stomach. That is the uh, thing. But then all, uh, you know, there is one study on these distended stomachs and, uh, uh, we, we, you know, very, very little percentage of that eventually turned out to be pyloric stenosis and most of them uh, were uh, normal means the ones which remained only stomach because if you see a distended stomach at the 20 week scan yes some of them eventually uh, may turn out to be a duodenal atresia by the time you see at 24 weeks you may just see a distended stomach and when you follow up at 24 weeks you will find the duodenum dilated but otherwise even in the third trimester if it is only the stomach which is distended then either it could be absolutely normal or yes a possibility of pyloric stenosis can always be there. Especially if uh, the lyca seems normal for gestation, yes, yes. wouldn't it? So if there's a previous Downs and GDM in present yes. pregnancy, low risk in NT and duo marker and normal TIFA, should NIPT be done? This doesn't seem to be related to today's topics, but anyone wants to take it? Pia, want to take this? If previous down and GDM in present pregnancy, low risk in NT and dual marker and normal TIFA, should NIPT be done? Is there a role of NIPT here? Everything is normal, previous downs. Unmute yourself. I need to know the type of down syndrome. Previous down was a translocation. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, you're here. Yeah. I'm so sorry, this, you can answer this better. Yeah. 
So the type of Down syndrome should be known. So whether it is a trisomy, uh, it's a frank trisomy or a translocation type of Down. So if it is a frank trisomy, then the risk of recurrence is going to be quite low. But if it was a translocation Down, the recurrence risk is high. So generally, if it is a, a frank trisomy, we can offer both the options, either an invasive or an NIBT. Mm. But if it is a translocation Down, an invasive is definitely required in those cases. So. Kakuli, what would you want to know about transient bowel dilatation? Critical things. Uh, I had reported a case uh, of similar, right? The bowel loops were much less dilated. And uh, by the time, and this was at around 32, 33 weeks of gestation. And there was no other complications. And by the time the baby delivered, uh, the and the postnatal radiograph and everything showed no bowel loops. But the, the bowel loops were dilated beyond 7 mm. So that's the reason I wanted to know, you know, is so there any uh, inputs from you, Bimal, sir? You can have this kind of transient uh, bowel dilatation, and that is why, in uh, you know, uh, in pregnancy, we say that uh, there are a lot of things which can just uh, be seen, and then uh, you know, we need to follow them up and see whether uh, they are persistent, and that is the reason the word persistent becomes important. But then if they were all more than seven millimeter. Not all uh, of them. Uh, yeah. They were uh, ranging from three to around seven. seven yeah, yeah. Uh, so that could, just, that could just be. Uh, so that's what when you see something like this, you document it and you ask for a follow up. That's always there. And then we are always giving a possibility. See that we are just at times we mention it just to put it as a mark of caution that yes, this is something which we need to look for. Unless they really fit into all the criteria to label it as something. So in bowel obstruction, um, do you need weekly serial scans or you can you space them even more? No, no, you can space them even more. Yeah. You don't so need. What weekly. would be the ideal? Uh, See, it depends. Uh, you, like if you are, if you have started, uh, you've seen it earlier. Say 23, 24 weeks, then. Maybe uh, four weekly, not before that. Yeah, I yeah. would like, because weekly is not going to help. But in a situation when you have picked it up directly at 35, 36 weeks, yes, because you don't this even have that. We had recommended of... because we picked up already by 35 weeks. So, yeah, you know, so we were expecting a delivery anytime. To... Anytime. And like Madam pointed out, because mm -hmm. the, you know, even uh, whether the liquor is increasing, how, how much it is increasing, whether that could lead to. Uh, some you know changes in obstetric management and that is the reason that would be required otherwise four weekly is a good time uh, when is the rectum called dilated and how do you measure it i think anita or ashwini can take this so uh, rectum dilatation is you compare it with the bladder rather because rectum is like really it can dilate so bladder when it is even larger bigger than the bladder uh, then you realize that rectum is really dilated and of course see the proximal uh, how would you measure it? Is there a way of measuring the rectum different from measuring small bowel? In the SAT section, the maximum diameter. Yeah. So, Ashwini, you can take this when to label it small stomach. Sorry, sir. When uh, to label a small stomach. Um, the stomach so should be small. It's, no, so I don't use uh, any particular nomograms or anything. It is a very subjective uh, assessment. So because nomograms have not been able to uh, exactly uh, tell us about the small stomach. So I usually call them back after a week. That is most important that I have always followed. Mm. Uh, first of all, I call them within that sitting only after an hour or two. And if still persistent, small, subjectively as assessed, I call them back after one week. Majority of the so-called small stomachs will look uh, normal and distended in the next uh, scan. So I don't use any particular dimension. Uh, I assess them subjectively. So I think we mean so if it's persistently small, then probably you would want to evaluate more, isn't it? And if there is an associated so, polyhydramnios, then poly it becomes more significant. But uh, so polyhydramnios so again will yeah. present by third trimester only. In the second trimester, we'll not even have that much. So persistently small, only then I'll uh, call them back yeah, after one week. Do you do the same thing for a dilated stomach? So how would you like to follow up such patients? 
सर अगेन एज वी डिस्कस्ड फॉर दी डायलेटेड सो कॉल्ड डायलेटेड स्टमक एंड इन द सेकेंड ट्राइमेस्टर अगेन आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल दम बैक आफ्टर वन वीक बिकॉज मेजोरिटी ऑफ दैम वील अगेन नॉर्मलाइज अनलेस दे हैव अदर एसोसिएटेड फाइंडिंग्स एज वेल कम्प्लीटली नॉर्मल स्कैन विथ स्लाइटली डायलेटेड स्टमक और अ स्लाइटली स्मॉल स्टमक कॉल आफ्टर वन वीक एंड रीअसेस बिफोर jumping to any uh, diagnosis for the uninitiated i think that it's reliable to rely on certain nomograms to get a hang of what because what they want to know is how do we say it is dilated or how do we say it is small so they they want to rely on an objective criteria and i think nomograms could help them to say at least whether this is below the fifth or above the 95 for that gestational age and then maybe depending on the likely and other parameters they can probably decide to follow up as well there is something, called the, there is something called the gastric area index yes yeah you yes. take the gastric area divided by the abdominal uh, uh, circumference and there is there is a figure for that you know see as ashwini said actually we normally go by the subjective thing because we, we have to remember these are tubular structures uh, you know uh, there is no fixed size this could be uh, you know you may find it uh, very huge at one moment and uh, half an hour later you may find it so giving a so even if i talk about normograms then uh, at what stage i have i measured it also becomes uh, important you know the the stomach must have just filled that the size would be larger stomach must have just emptied so i think the eyeball technique is still very good and uh, and there is not you know you don't need to be really worried about it in the sense you can there these are there are certain things which are just findings only thing is you see something like that uh, you know you should not mention that yes, uh, the stomach appeared small and uh, query is of visual atresia see that is where the problem goes you say that the stomach appeared small it was persistently small this needs to be reassessment is required up here yes, we need to uh, reassess you can then mention that uh, yes a reassessment is required a uh, follow up are required to look for polyhydramnios to rule out a possibility of an esophageal atresia something like that but if you start giving it as a diagnosis just based on one small finding the issue uh, becomes bad of course yes and um, the previous questions have mostly been answered by the faculty on the chat itself so do you use any disclaimer to cover the gi anomalies in your reporting formats no i mean uh, essentially i would like to answer that <laughs> yeah uh, so. okay so a disclaimer uh, is it's neither protecting you medical legally neither it is you know it, i find it quite redundant actually but at the same time uh, i do mention a line that uh, certain cardiac and gi anomalies will be evolving yes it is there in my uh, reports um, but uh, it is medical legally uh, it will not stand of course uh, more than anything that you put on the paper i think what we talk to the patient and to the referring obstetrician uh i think that stays uh longer and has a more uh, impact reassuring the patient at that point of time and explaining it to her uh helps and also to uh, talking to the obstetrician but uh, yes the disclaimer has a line about evolving gi and cardiac and other all anomalies I was a very strong believer in what ashwini said just now still a few years but See what happens is the more your experience increases, you realize that yes, verbal statements have no meaning at all. Okay. There is no meaning at all. I agree. Yes, how when you talk to the patient, it's important. All those things will. But as far as whether it will be medical legally, it will give you some. You don't know. But then at least it sure. what makes uh, the difference is that. you see a dry cleaner will always say goods one or a taken clothes from here the responsibility is over they have it behind their this thing you know it may not uh, but you are still going to go there but somewhere down the line it makes you feel no this person has already given it beforehand that so i 
if, even I, I was strongly against the use of disclaimers, I felt it causes more, uh, uh, you know, they start feeling you're not very confident about your job. But then those days are gone in this Google era with Google providing all that half-hearted, you know, information. So it's better that there should be a disclaimer. You can just maybe as a one-liner that, yes, there are certain anomalies which could evolve over a period of time. And they would be picked up in uh, the in the later scans. Maybe a single sentence, two sentences, but something should be added now. Yes, it is there. I am still reluctant to add it, but then learning about it that I yeah I agree really with uh, Bimal sir I personally that I, that's what I said I don't uh, like putting that disclaimer there but as I said even my reports have it uh, because of the environment that we live in. In fact, I have a larger disclaimer for uh, anomalies in my growth scan if it, they're coming to me for the first time for a growth you know in the third trimester. Yeah, that makes certain sense because of course. We are always liable, as you rightly said, at whatever point in time. Uh, there's another contentious question that uh, I want. Uh, that's actually for the first panel, but I can throw it open for you. Maybe Shlo can take this. Um, you know, we have this issue about, uh, you know, labeling an ovarian cyst as an ovarian cyst. I'll, I do that in my practice. I label an ovarian cyst and an ovarian cyst. Now, there are a lot of confusion about the ap appropriate authorities, you know, acting on their own whims in different cities. So what is your take on this? Should we or should we not label it as an ovarian cyst? I feel uh, particularly to be on the right side of the law, uh, we can uh, mask the word uh, ovarian. We can use a, a term as gonadal cyst rather than labeling it as an ovarian cyst. And it is obvious that gynecologists are, uh, uh, are referring physicians would understand what we are saying and we term as a gonadal cyst, intra-abdominal cyst. So uh, this is a way out of the whole situation rather than labeling and getting into a situation where you, your, uh, your report would be misconstrued as uh, uh, divulging the gender of the fetus. Uh, this is one way out. Uh, otherwise, uh, um, I always feel that a yeah, direct communication with the clinician also works around and uh, uh, speaking to the patient and explaining them that uh, uh, the possibility of a cyst arising from uh, 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 ovary, if it would be a, uh, uh, it be a female fetus, then uh, it would be an ovarian cyst. Uh, verbally communication also works around. Uh, Rather than putting down on paper. Look, any other from panelists? I mean, I feel yeah. that I, I, if we have I, an over insist, we have obliged to say that it is over insist. Yeah, yes. the medical legal consultants in uh, various talks have mm -hmm. uh, given us this opinion that we are, we would rather be okay with giving this but diagnosis. I, I also agree with uh, Shlok in the sense that appropriate authorities have a very Different yeah, way of that working. What works with us may not work with others. Yeah. So uh, I guess uh, there's no simple answer to this question. Mm -hmm. I have escaped by labeling an ovarian cyst for so long. So maybe yeah. my appropriate attorney is okay with it. But if you feel you're not, then I think you should follow what Shlok has said, that you label it as an adnexal cyst or a gonadal cyst and discuss it with an obstetrician in private rather than getting into a you know, sort of uh, uh, legal hassle. And See, I think that, uh, sorry. Uh, you know, anyway, we are not always 100% sure that it is an ovarian cyst. Yeah, See, yeah. Barabar. so anyway, yeah. we are not 100% sure about it. Yeah, but, so why, you know, I would some, rather play no. it safe. I would rather play it safe. And uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm in Shlok's gang. No, I am. See, I agree with you, but I'm saying when, when I'm sure, that is an ovarian cyst or a mesenteric cyst. I say it's an ovarian cyst or a mesenteric cyst. That's what I mean to say. So um, here the question was, and there's no clear answer to it as Bimal, very honestly, because we they have a various, uh, they, they have different ways of interpreting it, the law also. I'm talking about appropriate authorities. So in that case, that's what I meant. So I agree, that's what I said. It, it's uh, relative. You can choose. Shlok is also right where you can choose to say that it's an adnexal cyst and an ovarian cyst. 
So that finishes the questions of this and that brings it to the end of the webinar. I'm extremely sorry to Dr. Santosh Jaibhai. I just dropped out without introducing you. I wanted you to introduce, uh, be the introducer in initially. Dr. Santosh Jaibhai is the secretary of New Mumbai, uh, Navi Mumbai OBG UN Society. And uh, I wanted him to be the uh, introducer with me. Unfortunately, I dropped out. I would like you to give the Thank you, address to all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohit Shah. Uh, it was, uh, before I start my vote of thanks, I just want to make a comment about the thing which we're just discussing right now regarding the awarenesses. Uh -huh. if, you, if you read PCP NDT Act, it says uh -huh. communication regarding sex of the fetus in any manner. Uh -huh. It could be a direct communication or it could be a communication on the report in the form of an awarenesses. It, in the legal sense, it amounts to breach of the act. Mm. So, uh, because see, when we say overances, in a way we are communicating sex of the fetus. You're right. And that is uh, uh, definitely a contravention of that. So we need to keep that particular aspect in mind as far as this uh, that uh, issue at discussion is concerned. Uh, yes, it was absolutely a wonderful program and uh, the discussion, a unique type of program where a case discussion along with all those who were involved in managing the case uh, were uh, there presenting and as well as on the panel. It was definitely a very good uh, program with multiple take-home messages for all those who uh, attended the program and uh, I'm sure everyone is definitely be more cautious, especially uh, those uh, obstetricians who are doing growth scans as far as the uh, late evolving anomalies are concerned. I uh, thanks uh, Society of Fetal Medicine, uh, Dr. Mohit, uh, Dr. Vimal, uh, Dr. Praveen, Dr. Priya, and all the moderators, all the panelists who have uh, taken out time today uh, from their busy schedule to be with us and educating us on this particular aspect because uh, for majority of the obstetricians when anomaly scan is uh, done uh, at, at a later date the evolving anomalies most of us forget and uh, that sometimes creates a problem in deciding the management so i'm uh, definitely uh, sure that this today's webinar is definitely going to help to change the way we practice, especially uh, for these late evolving anomalies. Uh, last but not the least, I thank all the delegates who uh, attended the program. Uh, I suppose there were more than 500 delegates when the uh, program was there and almost till the last case, uh, the attendance was significant. So uh, I thank all uh, the panelists, all the moderators, organizers, as well as delegates. And I uh, once again thank Society of Fetal Medicine for giving NMOGS an opportunity to be a partner in the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. But I, I also see Dr. Ashok Khurana here. Uh, he has not been active so far, but I would want your take on this last question, sir, the contentious issue. Since you are here. Well, um, th thanks, Mohit. I, uh, I know this is okay, a Thank you. You know, yes, it is a contentious issue and there is a controversy that, yes, I've not disclosed the sex of the fetus in any manner. And yet there is another section of the PCP NDT Act that says that sex determination can be done under the following conditions, which includes um, the <clears throat> sex chromosomal abnormalities or the abnormalities that are related to, um, uh, to things like, like hemophilia or um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and that we can actually go ahead and do a sex determination under those conditions. So within the law, it becomes perfectly good, really, although there is no doubt that word-wise, Form F says something else, and uh, the actual uh, content and the clause says something else. So you see this, uh, the quotation that Dr. Jaibai had given us was from Form F, where I declare that I have not uh, disclosed the sex to anybody in any manner. And but this would be an indirect way of disclosing. But within each and every clause of the PCP and DT Act, there is one clause that clearly says that you can do a sex determination 
to find out, for instance, whether a codon villus sampling has to be done in that particular circumstance. So if that much is allowed within the PCP NDT Act, certainly this hardly seems to be of any consequence. But uh, these are the discrepancies that have been creating so much unpleasantness that we really have to be careful. In the district where I am, we have them, um, we have such a good communication with the appropriate authority that we don't really have any such problem. Uh, but the fact remains that there are people in, in our adjoining state of Haryana where they're constantly on the prowl to find us uh, at fault for whatever reason. And they walk in without following any of the protocols. So it really is something that, we, that where the real world of legality is something else. Uh, and uh, the, it's quite different from the act. The act allows you to do a sex determination, whereas the appropriate authority can misinterpret your action and therefore really have to be careful. So because we have such a negative wave against the medical profession in this country, and because the bureaucracy constantly has a complex about the superiority of doctors, we have to make sure that we protect ourselves. So it would be wiser in that context not to be direct about the sex in most districts. True. Thank you. Thank you. That sort of yeah. explains it. And um, I would like to thank all the panelists and the moderators. Thank you for it. Was a wonderful case build up. Wonderful discussions. Great questions. Thank you, delegates. Thank you, trade partners. Uh, uh, life said and uh, lilac thank you sumit thank you vishal for always being there thank you everyone it's wonderful hope to do it more often with the nmo ogs thank yes, you sir. so much santosh yes, dr. Thank, you. thank you dr suchita thank you dr anu i mean we'll do it more frequently with sure uh, yes sir no. thank you so much bye, -bye. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you good night good night bye bye good night